Anyway, talking about prudent things, what Kyle. Oh. Uh, we're talking about the Bible. And I know Tucker isn't saved, so Damn it, hopefully Tucker. this compels him. So today I'm, I'm going to tell yeah. the story of Samson. My now, mom loves this Samson segment. Samson <laughs> is, uh, is an Old Testament figure. And most people think, ah, I know Samson, can't cut your hair, gets with Delilah, nay, nay. They don't know the whole story of Samson. And Strong man. It's, it's longer, but there aren't necessarily more lessons. You've got to look for them. So it begins in the prequel stage of Samson, you know, going to his parents. So as with many things for the Jews, they did something that pissed God off, and God said, fuck you, you're going out of my presence again, go be slaves to some other people. And so there's some time into that, all the, the Israel, Israelites and Jews are really upset and just waiting for that next judge or prophet to come down and pull them out of this, this muck. And so one day, this guy named, the fuck was his name, Manoah, we're going to call him Mano from now on for short, uh, Mano and his wife were just a random, poor couple. A couple of Jews, very poor Israelites. And one day, an angel came down in angel form to Mano's wife and said, Hey, you're about to give birth to someone who's going to totally change the direction of this tribe. And she's like, Oh, that's awesome. And he's, he says, Yeah, yeah, it is. Now, all you got to do is make sure you don't smoke, don't drink, don't eat any grapes, nothing fermented, no uh mixed fabrics you know you're you're a jew you know the rules she Selfish. goes yeah i know I, I got it all planned out uh just don't do any of that and then you'll have a son he's going to do some fantastic things angel poof, poofs away she goes back to her husband mano and is like you will not believe what happened and i'm gonna read in the niv bible the new international version this is exactly what she says and i'm gonna say it in trump's voice because it makes sense a man of god came to me he looked like an angel of god very awesome <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what she said in the Bible. She goes up, says it was very awesome, and the husband goes, oh my God, so all you got to do is like not drink or smoke or anything, and then he, this kid's going to come out good? She goes, yeah. He goes, all right, well, like, what do we do afterward? Like, when the kid's here, how do we raise him then? She goes, oh, I didn't ask him that. Shit. Like, should we call him back? It's like an angel. You can't call him back. <laughs> and so he, he goes to the temple, prays, and goes, please send someone else here and tell us how to raise the kid. Like, we get it. Don't make a little fetal alcohol syndrome baby. But after he's born, how do we make sure he becomes a good dude and, and does all the things you want? And so a few days later, a man, regular old looking man, really an angel, comes down the road, talks to Mano, goes, hey, you know, the Lord pushed me to, to come to you and tell you that all you have to do for your child is make sure that a razor never touches his head or any part of his body. A razor is in like shaving, you know, removing hair. Uh, and also make sure that your wife abides by all those rules I said before. And he was like, okay, yeah, that, it's not that helpful, but you are just a guy. You're not an angel. So I guess this is how God wants me to figure it out. Okay, whatever. He doesn't know this guy's an angel. He goes, well, at the very least, let me be hospitable. Stay with me for dinner. And the angel who's not letting on goes, no, I don't want to stay for dinner. He goes, I insist you must stay for dinner. And the angel goes, if you're going to, or I'll, I have a goat, we'll kill the goat and we'll eat it together. He goes, I'm not going to stay for dinner, but if I do stay, as you're asking me, take that goat and sacrifice it to the Lord. And Mano is like, oh, uh, oh yeah, like, like this goat, this, like my only goat. You want me to burn my own? Do you look around? Do you th we don't have a lot of goats. We've got one goat. <laughs> this is our food for the next month. Can't be fiddle like, fucking you, our goats to death. Yeah, no, we, we have one goat. Like I was planning on eating this for a while, but yeah, I, I guess I'll just burn it. I'll just burn it for God. Because you're telling me to. Have you, have you looked around my house? Have you, have you looked around my one-bedroom, dirt-floor, thatched-roof house? Do you smell salmon in here? We don't have any fish. That's my wife's Bronze Age pussy you're smelling. It's horrible in here. We have nothing to eat, and you're asking me to sacrifice this goat and burn it to you. And so he goes, he burns the goat begrudgingly. And he also burns some grain with it because the Lord is notorious for needing a side. And, <laughs> and uh, after all that is burned... Uh, the, the guy just leaves. They're hungry. And nine months later, out pops Happy Samson, ready to, to take on the world. And as with most Bible stories, it doesn't talk about the childhood. It goes straight to the adulthood of the character. So now we're like early 20s, like pussy slaying Samson. Like he's, he's got long hair like a rock star. And so he's, he's troll. Oh, he's Fab Perfect. <laughs> he's Fabio. Picture him like that. A little more matted and nasty. And, <laughs> and a beard because you can't, you can't shave anywhere. And hey, so... You. He is <laughs> and no Jew, manscaping. Yeah. Yeah. And so he is. Oh, God. <laughs> he's trolling around this city of Timna looking for strange. And he comes <laughs> across this lady 
and he's totally infatuated with her. He fucking loves her. And so he goes back, but she's a Philistine. That's the problem. She's not Jewish. She's a, a Philistine. And they are very much in competition with each other right now, these two tribes. And the Philistines are much stronger and larger. And so it's not uh, something you want to tango with. And so he goes back to his family and he goes, hey, I found this woman. I want her as my wife. So I need you to go there and get her for me. Because that was back when women were treated appropriately as property instead of like having to pretend to care about what they say. And so <laughs> now they go, uh, the dad goes, Oi, vey, son, you're going to go and find someone who's not Jewish? My goodness. No, there's plenty of good women right around here. Look at Rachel. And he goes, Rachel, she looks like, looks like a fucking sundial with that schnoz. No, I'm not going for Rachel. I'm going for that Philistine woman, that sexy bitch right over there. And so the dad goes, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll back that. They all, uh, he goes back to the family on the way, uh, goes back to the woman's family he's interested in in order to relay to her that, all right, wedding's on. And on the way, he's by himself. A lion leaps out of the brush, comes to attack him. The Lord imbues him with, you know, that strength that he has from his hair, and he tears the lion apart, like, with, like the way you would a goat, was the example in the Bible, <laughs> which apparently is like, you ready for goat? <laughs> no and so he tore the lion apart left it there and miraculously like if i killed a lion that would be in my tinder bio that would be in my twitter bio that would be my permanent facebook status it would be on my on my resume everyone would know he didn't tell anyone and it was weird because he was a braggadocious fella and he continues on tells his woman hey wedding's on i got to go back to my people grab my posse my friend's family and then we'll meet you back here have the whole shindig so he heads back, grabs his family, and as they're moving back towards, towards the wedding party, which is the Philist they're going to the, the woman's place in Philistine, the Philistinian territory, I don't know what it would be called. And on the way back, they see that same lion carcass. And the lion carcass is de decomposed a bit. And there are bees swarming all around it. And so Samson, in what it can only be described as a, an insane person's maneuver, <laughs> goes over to the hollowed-out carcass of this lion where the bees are, dips his hands into the carcass, and retrieves two big old handfuls of honey. And so the rest of the walk there, uh, he's eating honey out of his hands <laughs> on, the way, on the way to his own wedding. And to set the stage, <laughs> this is a man who lives in the year one who has never showered. He has never been allowed to cut a hair from his head, and he's eating honey out of his hands on the way to his wedding. This is, there's never been a stickier human being in history <laughs> than Samson on this walk. It's like, it's not bad enough that you have, I live 500 years before Christ shits every day. You're going to eat two handfuls of honey on the way to your wedding, you goddamn maniac. And so, and so he eats his honey. It's disgusting and sticky uh, by the time he, he gets there. They get there, though, and it goes off without a hitch for the most part. Like, uh, the dad, Samson's dad was, like, pissed because he was like, you're going to associate with these uncircumcised folks? But Samson, like, convinced him. He's like, dad... Believe it or not, it never crossed the minds of these savages to bring a sharp stone to the genitals of, of young boys. It's like, oh, that's, that's horrific. It's terrible. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'll get over it, you know. And so they get over it, and they have the wedding. It's a nice little occasion. And after the wedding, after the wedding, uh, they're all sitting around in a powwow. And Samson goes to the, the, the relatives of his wife, the Philistines, and goes, hey, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a riddle. And if you can riddle me that, I'll give you 30 outfits of linen. If you can't figure it out, though, you got to give me 30 outfits of linen. And they're like, oh, seems like a pretty reasonable thing. All right, let's do it. <laughs> and so he tells the riddle of, and I read it, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. Now, obviously, this was him talking about out of the eater, the lion, Honey comes, that's sweet, and out of the lion, something strong, you know, something sweet, like that, that kind of shit. But it's cheating. You can't make a riddle based on an experience that only you know about and then expect people to understand. Like, that's like the, the self-actualization of a two-year-old, where you think if you saw something, everybody's seen it. And everybody will get it. Like, that's, that's retardation. So my contention is that he was cheating. <laughs> okay. and, yeah, he, he was cheating from the start, is my contention. Samson was. He was giving an un, a riddle in bad faith. It's like playing peekaboo and covering your own eyes. Yeah, it's like, hey, Woody, I've got an interesting riddle about my seventh grade birthday party. 
Now, you know, no one in the details or the, you know, the tendrils going out that'll give you hints. Like, it's, it's not fair. And so he gives this riddle, and nobody can figure it out because they weren't there. And so, like, two days later, the family of the woman go, hey, you got to get this fucking riddle because I don't know if you've looked around, but we're not exactly running a fucking courtyard Marriott. We don't have linen to hand out. Like, we, we're, we, we took this assuming we'd know the riddle. We're pretty good riddlers, but we don't have any linen. We're going to be humiliated and, and embarrassed, and we're not really on friendly terms with the rest of their tribe, just this family now. And so she goes, okay, I'll go do it. And so for the next five days, she, the, the word nag is used in the Bible. She nags and cries and bitches for so many days in a row that eventually Samson on the last day goes, yeah, okay, okay, the answer is the lion. The answer is the lion and honey inside it, okay? Please, oh my God, week one, week one of our, of our marriage. Golly, I should have listened to my parents, you dumb whore. And it's furious. And 20 minutes later, she, she leaves. 20 minutes later, all the Philistines come back, and they're like, uh, Samson, we figured out your riddle. And he's like, oh, did you? Did you know? Did you figure out my riddle? What is it? And so they told, they told him, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than lion? Which apparently was the two questions that aren't a riddle, or the answer to a riddle that was two questions that weren't... Nah. The, it's Jeopardy. These ancient people didn't understand what riddles were. <laughs> <laughs> he, he answered the question. Anyway. Yeah. And so they give him that, and he goes, cheated. You cheated. I just gave my wife that answer, and she went and gave it to you. And so Samson stood up calmly, and then he murdered 30 people. <laughs> <laughs> With his bare hands, he went around the camp, and he murdered 30 people, and then he left, saying, someday I'll get my vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, <laughs> what the okay. right. Samson is a terrorist at this point. <laughs> you know, he does not take kindly to those other folks. And so from there, he uh Samson he is Jewish. Home. He killed the terrorists. Correction. Yeah. He, he spends some time, like, mulling his own shit over in the desert or whatever while everybody else goes back. Uh, he eventually returns home <coughs> and goes to his dad. Hey, I want to I wanna talk to my wife. He goes, your, your wife? That Philistine woman who, who lied to you and you killed 30 of her family members? No, when I was leaving, I said I gave her to someone else. Like, no, that's not your, that's not your wife anymore. And Samson goes, God, fucking bullshit. Well, then I, then I definitely need to get my vengeance. You know, she's, she's de dead to me. And so he does what any sane person would do. He's got to get vengeance on these <laughs> Philistines. They're stronger. They're more powerful. What do you do? What you do is you go into the woods and you catch 300 foxes. <laughs> 300 foxes. Have you ever tried to catch one fox? <laughs> <laughs> It's fucking impossible. You're not going to catch 300 foxes. It's insanity. And so he catches 300 foxes. And then he does another sane thing. He takes them two by two and ties their tails together. And then once he has 150 paired off, <laughs> paired off fox pairings, you know, very hard to manage. <laughs> he puts torches in the night and ties those into the tails and lights them and releases them all over Philistine territory and all of their crops. And so the next morning when they wake up, they're like, there's a lot of burned foxes and no <laughs> crops left. And there's a torch in all the foxes' tails. And this is very methodically done. A serial killer is in our midst. Is this that terrorist Samson? Is this that terrorist Samson that we're all so scared of all the time <laughs> with the strength of 10 men and the temperament of a one-year-old? Like, <laughs> Is this the man? And so they're terrified of Samson because he just destroyed everything. And so the Philistines go back and they go, uh, they, they go to the woman that uh, he initially married, the Philistine woman and her father. And they're so mad, they just burn them too, probably with the last remaining pair of foxes running around. And they burn those two to death. And then... Uh, I'm trying to remember what happened here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's so in depth. <laughs> he couldn't. Oh yeah, better. I remember. Okay. No, no, no. Now, yeah, you couldn't just throw torches. No, he had to tie. You didn't want to throw a torch when you could swing two foxes around like a <laughs> madman and hurl them. But uh, and after he did this, after he did all the fox shenanigans, he went and re retreated into a cave in the wilderness and just ah. hung out there. And so. After that, all the Philistines, like a few thousand of them, are like, this is horse shit. We are marching to the Jewish camp uh, of Judea, 
and we're going to make them give us Samson. So they march over there, and they go, uh, where the fuck is Samson? He just tied a bunch of uh, hundreds of hundreds of foxes together and burned <laughs> our crops down after killing 30 of us for, for uh, cheating on a cheat riddle of his. <laughs> and they go, we don't know where he is. Frankly, we'd be happy if you caught him. He's causing a lot of mischief, and he's not reflecting well. He's terrible PR. We're a very small tribe, and he's causing a lot of mischief out there, and people keep coming up to us. And they go, okay, well... We believe you. We're going to search anyway. They search. They go, all right, we totally believe you, but we're way stronger than you. So while we're here, we're just going to conquer you. And they're like, ah, fuck, we should have seen that coming. And so they got conquered right there too. And so then a thousand Jews from Judea go to that cave and they go to Samson and they go, we got to turn you in. And Samson's like, you couldn't turn me in if you wanted to, but here, how about this? You tie me up. And you bring me back there to those thousands of, uh, of guys. And you say, we got him. We got the guy for you. He's right here. And then I'll burst out of there. And then they go, yo, dude, that's an incredible idea. And then like, then like Noah, you can throw him a sword. And Ezekiel, you can throw him a shield. And, uh, and uh, Samson goes, no, no. <laughs> I'll use the jaw of an ass. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then they all go, yeah, 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 yeah whatever, whatever you want to do, man. Just uh, just remember, like, we're on your team. And he goes, yeah, job and ass. This is a good idea. <laughs> and so they, they take him over there, bound up, and they get him close enough to the Philistines, and they go, here he is. And he gets close, and he bursts out with his ass bone jaw <laughs> and smashes a thousand of them to death. A thousand people he murders with the jawbone of an ass. <laughs> well, he was right. A thousand. Yeah. yeah and, and as they're watching it, Ezekiel's like, well, we appear quite the fools. <laughs> he, he really didn't need the sword and shield. And so after he's finished massacring a thousand people dripping with blood, not like in movies like Braveheart or Predator, where there's like drips of their own blood a little bit. I mean like half a second after you get out of the pool, that level of drippage in blood, there's a snail trail of all blood types smeared around this land. And he comes back up to them. <laughs> and, and all the Jews are like, Frankly, Samson, half an hour ago, we were ready to turn you in. Never before has there been such a political turn in an environment. Raise your hand if you don't want Samson to be in charge. Everyone <laughs> wants you to be in charge, Samson. And so <laughs> Samson, dripping with blood, decides he's going to be in charge. And so after that, though, he decides he needs a little more, just a touch more vengeance. <laughs> like Jesus he has Christ! <laughs> <laughs> Holy David cheat on a riddle for fuck's sake. It's, it's... <laughs> Dude, that's all throughout the Old Testament. They'll be like, ah, and someone of the Ammonites stole a goat. And the, you know, the Jewish uh, Old Testament God is like, and he smout 50,000 of them for it. <laughs> and it's, like, it's insane. But it now gets to the point that people are more familiar with. Samson and Delilah. So a little more time passes, and he falls head over heels for this lady Delilah, and she's a fox. Like they were, like back in the day, they were like they were the Brangelina of the day, and so it wasn't oh, like shit. a relationship. Everybody fucking knew Samson was plugging Delilah, and so the Philistines go to Delilah and are like, "Hey, you got to give us info on how he gets his strength because we got to get rid of this." The Phyllis, we're rightly looking for vengeance here. We've lost thousands of people to this madman. Look at that. We don't know where he is. We're whispering right now. He's terrifying. Like, and so they, they basically convince her to be on like a little secret agent. And so she goes to him one night after they bang. And she goes, Samson, what gives you all your strength? And he goes, well, if they'd only known to tie my hands with seven unused bowstrings, they would have never had that problem. I would have been as weak as any other man. And so during the night, she tied his hands with four unused oh, bowstrings, no. woke up to, or seven, I'm sorry, seven unused bowstrings, and the Philistines are there waiting, ready, anticipating picking him up, and he wakes up, bursts out, and murders a dozen or so of them, <laughs> you know, this time in self-defense, fair enough. Yeah. And then I guess they go back to bed being like, why I ought to, you know, to Delilah. <laughs> and then the next day, he tells her this rinse and repeat, you know, why, why would you lie to me last night? And he doesn't ask, why'd you try to have me murdered and captured? He just goes with it because he's an idiot. And he goes, all right, well, if you use, like, brand new rope, that'll get me. I, 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 they've only ever used used rope on me. That's why I can burst out. And so they do that. 
once again bursts out, and the twelve, anticipating and terrified Philistines, are <laughs> <laughs> like, we know what happens here, guys. We didn't want to be here. Oh, we're group two? It's always <laughs> group three or four that gets them. Like, and that's like, damn it. We, we saw what you did just now. I don't... <laughs> oh. The bodies are still here. <laughs> <laughs> Samson, I told you to move them. <laughs> and so he murders all of them. Then I guess Delilah once again gets off scot-free. The next day he tells her, if you braid my hair in this way, I'll, I'll be helpless. So she does that. The third group of a dozen or so Philistines stand up. He's like, I'm not even tied up this time. Wah, 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 wah. And it beats the shit out of him, kills him. And then finally, she badgers him enough that he goes, my hair, my hair is the source of my strength. If you cut it off, I got nothing. Jesus Christ, will you shut the fuck up? <laughs> like, the, he's, Samson has terrible choice in women, uh, but it's good to see some things never change. Mm. So uh, the next day, he's sleeping, or next night evening, or next evening, he's sleeping. She snips his hair off. Then the Philistines come in, and he stands up to fight him, and he's just a normal dude now. He doesn't have his superpowers. God said, I'm only interested in lo- lustrous locks. You know, I, that's all I'm in for. Mm-hmm. And so they come in, they pin him down, they immediately gouge his eyes out and blind him, and so he can't be a threat anymore. And then they drag him off and they give Delilah all sorts of sweets and spoils. And so then they take him blind and beaten in a regular man, and they put him on a grain mill where you're just wa- like what they would use donkeys for. Like you're just pushing this thing around and around and around. And he does that for months. And I guess everybody forgot. Let's give this guy regular haircuts. <laughs> 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 because a couple months later, there's a big Philistine celebration, much similar to when we caught Bin Laden. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, everybody's like, yeah, we got him, we got him, yeah! Like, they're all in this big, beautiful building, all the Philistines. There's 3,000 people on the roof and all the elites underneath. And they say, bring out Samson, bring him out, bring out this murderer! This murder, and they're jeering at him because everyone there has someone they know who's been murdered by this animal. And mm-hmm. they put him up there, they throw stuff at him, and they go, Gah, get out of here. And he collapses. You know, his hair's gotten a little longer, though. And he stands up, still blind, and he goes, Please let me lean up against a pillar. And so they put him up against a pillar to lean there. And he summons God and says, God, with my last act, please let me bring this down upon the Philistines. And so he puts one hand on one pillar one hand on the other, and he uses his last bit of strength and collapses it and murders another 5,000 Philistines (laughs) with his final breath. (laughs) And this is the story that I used to guide my entire life. (laughs) In the words of Kyle. Yeah. (laughs) Seems just. Yeah. Yeah. The Tucker first, wasn't first, a believer before that story, no, but now... No, the first five minutes of that story, I was like, I'm bored. And then it just... Samson, you know, he really just kept going, huh? Have you guys heard about the story of Cain and Abel? I was going to save it for PKA, but I thought, you know, this this really doesn't have any moral uh, relevance right now. But I thought of it, and so I'm going to burn it, you know? Fuck those guys trying to steal all my Bible stories. Can you believe... Have you guys been noticing that too? Those fuckers over there are trying to lead me into a Bible story every week now as if these things just grow on trees. No. The only thing that grows on trees around here is fruit that will ruin your descendants' livelihoods and send them to hell for eternity. There is nothing like a a great Bible story that grows on a tree. And they're trying to get me to spend them all on PKA and I'm just not going to have it. I'm not going to stand for it. So you're getting this one right now. Um, This is one. It's actually... uh, covered in the muslim faith as well as the christian faith it's a little different i don't know the muslim version uh other than like the beginning is the same i guess but also this story is very very close to the beginning of the book so i don't really think anybody had gone rogue yet um anyway so cain and abel two brothers two brothers living in ancient times the sons of adam and eve adam and eve if you didn't know they were the ones who god created them first Long story short, this is for another time, uh, like a prequel. Adam and Eve in the garden, eventually they get into a bit of a kerfuffle. Um, God is not happy about it and says, Eve, you're going to have a lot of trouble pushing kids out of your cooch for all eternity. And Adam, you're going to have to listen to this bitch complain about it. And you're going to have to support her kids and really not be appreciated. And your hands are going to be sore because it's hot and, and it's it's really shitty in this world everywhere. But this one place that I made that was great that you're not, not allowed into anymore. Um, and so they were both like, fuck, this sucks. 
All right. And so they leave. They start their own farm, um, which which is so silly to me. Like, think about that. God made the Garden of Eden, which is dope. It's super dope. It's the best oasis to have ever existed, ever. Purportedly. You know, maybe God's tooting his own horn. Um, but I'm sure it was a lot of fun. And then... The only two people that live there, the only tenants, piss him off so much that he kicks them out. And then they have to go start, like, a dirt farm somewhere. But what you don't realize is, like, I think of God as being, like, playing The Sims. And he's got this really cool palace that he built, you know, with this awesome oasis and everything for his uh, NPCs. But, or I guess they are playable characters. and But they're not even there. He's making them toil on a shitty-looking, aesthetically unpleasing dirt farm three miles away while he looks at this this oasis just diminishing in value, you know? I, I, I never understood that. I feel like God would at least give him more chances because he would think, like, hey, I went through all the time of making this fucking oasis. I can at least make, like, a, an oasis tier level where it's like, all right, you're not in the top oasis tier. I'm moving you down one, uh, you know, three infractions there, and you get moved over adjacently to, uh, like, the level three oasis. And then eventually, if you really fuck up, you eventually get down to, like, the dirt farm. But I think that going straight from paradise to a dirt farm, uh, especially for the first people to have ever existed, was probably a little harsh. Um, Regardless, regardless, they're out there toiling. And Adam goes, all right, maybe God's going to be a little happier if we pump out some kids. He really wants this whole earth thing to get up and running. Uh, So they do. They, They pump out a couple kids. They never specify in the Bible like, what order they were having kids. And so, when I was a little kid, I used to ask, like, so Cain and Abel were the first two people ever born, right? And they were like, well, you don't know, because later in the book it says that Cain was a city builder, which implies that there had to be more people. And then I was like, okay, so the only explanation other than that would be that Adam and Eve had tens of thousands of children before Cain and Abel, and none of them made the cut. You know, there were a lot of Rachels and Steves and Isaacs and and Jacobs roaming about before Jesus finally saw the Cain and Abel twins and was like, that, that's what I want. That's what I fucking want. Uh, so uh, anyway, they have Cain and Abel. They're growing up brothers. For the sake of this, I'm going to assume that it's just four people on the planet, you know, a real sausage fest, uh, <laughs> because it doesn't make any sense to assume there's already cities of their children living elsewhere. Um, so they're just... Living together, loving God, uh, a little bit resentful, you know, not happy about getting kicked out of the the garden. But Cain and Abel don't know anything about the garden other than it was pretty sweet. But you know, they don't, they can't remember it, so they're not as pissed. Uh, They've only ever known the dirt farm. So God, at this point, still chit chats with all four of them. So it's like a sitcom almost, Um, like a Seinfeld with someone screaming down who's benevolent, Uh, or not so much benevolent as just kind of fickle. Um, and so they're all hanging out, Adam, Eve, in the house, making dinner, Cain and Abel, Cain is a farmer, he farms plants, you know, he's got corn, he's got peas, other vegetables, assorted fruits, maybe, I don't know, Abel was the meat man, he was Mr. Meat, he had the lambs, he had the donkeys, anybody want some beef, oh, Abel's your man, thank God for him, uh, best butcher in the world, at this point, <laughs> bar none, best one in the world, and for some reason, they were both like, all right, it's been, it's been a couple weeks, we haven't sacrificed anything to God, let's, let's round up the best of what we got, burn it for God, sacrifice it to him, and he'll be really happy with us, and they both go, all right, Cain goes on over to his, uh, his fucking farm, Chops down the best bits of corn, the best soybeans, the best beets, you know, all of the, the the colorful stuff. Like, this wasn't your, this was not the vegetables that come on the Big Mac. These are the vegetables that are on the poster for the Big Mac. He was like, you know, you're, I'm, not, I'm, I'm taking the best carrots, I'm taking the best potatoes, all of it. Puts it down, gets, shows it to God and goes, hey, you know, look at this. This is pretty great, right? Just as that's happening... Abel comes over, and Abel's brought, like, the firstborn of every one of his livestock's kids. And he's like, hey, God, I'm about to take this knife and slit, like, all eight of these animals' throats and let them bleed out right here because I think you're dope, I appreciate you, and I got your back. And God is watching both of them, 
And at first, God was like, he looked over at, at Cain's plants, and he wasn't, like, psyched about it. Like, it's kind of like when someone brings, I don't know, what's a good example? It's like when someone brings vegetables and ranch dip to a grill party, or, you know, you're watching the game at your house, and uh, you have some friends over, and somebody brings beer, somebody brings chips, and somebody brings, like, uh, fucking carrots to dip. It's like, uh, you, you, fuck you. Like, you, kn you knew that we didn't want this. You knew none of us wanted this, and yet here you are. And that's exactly what God did. God looked down at Cain's offering, basically, like, spit at him in frustration, and was like, this is some bullshit. I don't want plants. You knew that I didn't want plants, and you still got me plants. He looks over to Abel, and Abel, by now, is cutting the fourth head off of one of those lamb children, and God's, like, loving it, masturbating up there to the thought of that, that warm blood seeping into his earth, his dirt farm. Uh, he loves that stuff. Like, old school, Old Testament God uh, was a tribal blood cult that demanded sacrifices, and so... The, that's not uh, bashing it or being some like, oh, I'm fucking enlightened and what that. It's just the fucking facts. Read the book. Um, so, Cain is livid. Cain is more upset than he's ever been in his life. He didn't even know you could be this mad at someone. He's At first, he's mad at God, but then he's mad at Abel. He's looking over at Abel and just seething with anger. Cut to black. You know, it's the next scene. God talks to Cain, the guy whose plants he didn't like. And God, after this whole thing, had the fucking audacity to tell Cain, like, why are you so pissed off, man? You knew I wouldn't like it. Like, that's, that's not exactly what God said, but it was real close to that. And you have got to know that that was pretty condescending. You know, God, first of all, anytime God asks you a question, he's just being a real cunt. Because he knows the answer. Oh, why are you so pissed off? Oh, I don't know, God. Why don't you tell me why I'm pissed off? You put me in charge of the fucking corn, and then when I bring you the corn, the best corn, you're, you're taking all of his goat blood over it, even though you're the one who gave him control of the goats. This is horse shit. You know why I'm mad. This isn't fair. And so God kind of just goes, all right, <laughs> chill out, dude. This, you, you are so pissed off for no reason. You knew I wouldn't like it. Stop acting like you thought I would like this present. You know too much about me to think I would like this present. And so for you pretending that you think that I would like this present is actually really hurtful, Cain, after everything I've done for you. So I'm going to go hang out with Abel some more. And you just talk to me again when you get some fucking animals with blood in them. Uh, really sassy talk, talking back and forth. This, God did not do this in later seasons. He only does this very early. Um, where he directly contacts the, the, his, his players. So Cain, just as irate, goes over to Abel, tells Abel, Hey, come with me to this field. We should get more stuff to sacrifice to God. And Abel's like, well, but we just did that. And Cain's like, oh, whatever, you know, just, just come with me. That's the point. The point of this is come with me. You shouldn't be suspicious. There's no such thing as murder yet. Come on. Um, and so they're headed out to the field. And when they're way out in the field to where Cain thinks that God can't see, uh, Cain kills him. Just, boom! Kills his own brother. Abel's dead. Abel is dead. And Cain knows that God is going to find out. Because immediately after he kills Abel, he's just like collapses and is like, oh, fuck! Like, there's only, th there were four people on the planet, and now there's three. That's... That's a 25% decrease in one day. The guy, he's going to fucking notice. Like, he, even if he doesn't know our names yet, he's going to know. One, two, three, I have a fourth. Where is he? Oh, I checked the whole world. He's dead over there. Fuck you, Cain. And so he's, he's terrified. Um, I can go into this next part a little more later, like a part two thing. But suffice it to say that Cain was cursed, you know, called the Mark of Cain. A lot of people thought that means that he was black. I don't know what that means. Um, I know what it means to be black. I just didn't think that that's what the mark of Cain meant. It was basically saying that, hey, don't kill this guy because he's destined for suffering. So maybe it was like a swastika on his forehead or something. Um, anyway, God sends Cain away. Says that Cain is like a city builder and whatnot and has a pretty successful life. Uh, but it comes off more that Cain lived a life of like a real estate entrepreneur. And even though he made a lot of money and was successful... Uh, he never could quite get over the fact that he knew God hated him and he was going to burn for all eternity in hell as soon as he died. Um, that would put a damper on any plan, but 
Uh, yeah, Cain was the first murderer, and Abel the first murder victim. So there you go. That uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that I got more of that right than I got the Job story right. And actually, I got the Job story pretty spot on, aside from the last part where someone's like, "Oh, Job got his stuff back twofold, so it was really okay." But it's like, no, he fucking didn't. I guarantee he, even if he got twice as many fucking cows and goats and a bigger house, he still wasn't happy knowing that his entire family was murdered and crushed under the rubble, you know, covered in boils. Probably wasn't happy about that. Even worse than that is if God just sent back, like, two versions of all his kids. Now it's just upsetting and like a zombie scenario and, and nobody wins. Now, now people dislike you even more on the block. But I guess you need that. You need more kids to take care of your bigger farm. Um... But I don't think they gave him more kids. Probably just more slaves. Because slavery was cool at the time. Um, anywho. Let's get to some questions. Because because that was... Yeah, I just took a long long time to get nowhere. Right there. But um, anywho. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Leave, leave a comment with more Bible stories that you guys want to hear about. You know? And keep in mind, I will not research them. And I will not look into the facts of what is written down in that book. It's true. If we're looking for a new topic, I, I, I outlined a little Bible tale for us it's been a hot second oh i'd love that what what are you going to regale us with today taylor i was gonna do easter but i wanted to do something a little less common knowledge and so mm -hmm. are either of you familiar with the tale of shadrach meshach and abednego, <laughs> and abednego. <laughs> wait yes. wait say it again shadrach meshach and abednego yep, yes it's uh kyle yeah. does know it i oh, went to church yeah no i legit yeah. thought he made up an eeny meeny miny mo type of thing. <laughs> no, 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 go to go to uh, Daniel three through six. I think is where. Yeah, I know because I reread it. Uh, reread it. Please don't tell me the story, and I just disappointed my parents. Yeah, no, uh, and your parents, Mister and Mrs. Woody's parents. Uh, I dare you to find one thing wrong with this. <laughs> one factoid wrong with this. So basically, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Three Jews hanging out in the Old Testament, uh, and this is one of the many times that the Jews or the state of Israel was just getting, uh, or maybe Judah at the time, I don't fucking remember. They were just getting butt-fucked by whatever powerful people there were at the time. There were the Babylonians, like Assyrians, like all throughout the ages. This was a Babylon time. And so they were under the thumb of King Nebuchadnezzar, the original Chad. And King Nebuchadnezzar was, he had his hanging gardens of Babylon, like they were the most powerful empire in the world, in their known world at the time. And he had all this dope shit. And he had so much extra gold sitting around that he was like, you know, it would be tight. I'm going to build a 90 foot solid gold statue of like myself or some like guy who's kind of like me there or some, you know, God. They don't even like really say what it was. And so he built some dope ass statue, gold, 60 cubits high and what six cubits wide and i looked that up that's like 90 feet high and nine feet wide like a cubit is apparently like one and a half feet okay hmm. so this is a lot of gold it's a real flex on the rest of the world and so he builds this and he's so stoked on it that he invites all of his i don't remember all the words i read them down all of his officials from the kingdom governors senators satraps i assume some kind of mayor judges treasurers, everybody from every corner of the Babylonian kingdom, all the high-ranking, you know, hullabaloo people show up. And they're like, you're right. You're right, King Nebuchadnezzar. This is, this is really cool. And he's like, it doesn't stop here, guys. Anytime you hear music from, and I'll read this list, <laughs> as I'll just read what the town crier said. Nation and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of the gold king Nebuchadnezzar. And so, first of all, pretty sure a lot of those instruments are made up. <laughs> so he sends all the governors and everybody back. They relay that same message. And... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they weren't just like three random Jews walking around the street in like shitty ass sandals. They had like not the, the overruling part of a province, but they were like a couple levels down. They, they still had nice houses, nice shit. Like they, they weren't in poverty or anything. And pretty much immediately, as soon as this town crier said that, he added an addendum 
which Nebuchadnezzar also instructed, where he's like, and make sure they also know anybody who doesn't bow down as soon as all these made up instruments start going, they're going to be brought back to me. They're going to be brought in front of me and I'm going to burn them alive in a really cool big furnace I also made. And believe it or not, that was compelling to most people. That got them on board. And so as soon as they heard the zither and the lyre, boom, right down, like almost like Mecca. They're like, even if you can't see it from whatever province they're in, they're like, I'm not risking some ancient cop finding me and ratting me out. I'm aiming right there and praying to Nebuchadnezzar. Right. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, fuck you. They don't say, fuck you. They say, no, thanks. No, thank you. Their overseer goes to King Nebuchadnezzar, goes, hey, Neb. Neb goes, don't call me that. He goes, I understand. <laughs> he goes, King Nebuchadnezzar. These three Jews, they're not bowing down. Did you tell him about the furnace thing? Yes, I led with the furnace thing. <laughs> yes, of course I told you. <laughs> of course I led with it, you fucking, you brilliant king. Uh, and, so, and so Nebuchadnezzar is like, okay, well, bring them to me. Bring them to me. As far as I can tell, they're doing a good job on paper, but if they're not going to do what I want, bring them here. <clears throat> so he brings them there and he tells them, hey, and King Nebuchadnezzar, is like in the opposite situation of like a rock in a hard place. With He's between like tits and ass. No matter which way he goes, it's positive. If they show up and they say, I'm not bowing down, he gets a handful of tit, so to speak, where he gets to throw them in the furnace, burn them alive, and ensure that everybody's like, yeah, that bitch is not playing. He will burn you alive, bow. Or... If they do what he wanted them to do, nice handful of ass, and they bow down, it's a little ego stroke where he's like, yeah, all it really took was them seeing me in my glory for them to bow down and do it. All right. And so they show up. He says, bow down or you're going in the furnace. No other options. They say, I will not, I will not bow down. No, I'm not bowing down. No, that's not my God. I'm not bowing down to your, your false idol or whatever the fuck. And he goes like probably a little like kind of like happy about it. Like, okay, time to break in the furnace. But he tells his furnace guy first, he goes, turn it up seven times as hot as normal. And in my head, I'm thinking like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego at this time were kind of relieved where they're like, oh, oh, he said seven. Seven's one of those numbers that works out well. God, if he had said turn it up twice as hot, I would have shit myself. But seven, <laughs> we should be okay. Thank God. And so, okay. and so Nebuchadnezzar, well, seven is a biblical number. Like, yeah, it's all you see it a lot. Oh, you're talking yeah, to me, you know like, I know that. Yeah, yeah, things happen in sevens all the time in the Old Testament and in the New. And so Nebuchadnezzar wasn't just content with normal soldiers tying him up because he's brought some of his governors and satraps and people to see this whole thing. Because he thinks it's cool. It is cool. And he brings out his most burly, ripped soldiers to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then he tells them, throw them in the fire. And he says that the fires were so hot that when they went to open the furnace to throw the three Jews in, that the men throwing them in themselves died. And so he wasted a bunch of juicy man muscle <laughs> just in trying to get his point across which i wouldn't have done i would have used worthless soldiers but what do i know i'm no neb mm. and so he throws him in there and he's sitting on his cool gold throne the extra gold that was left over from the statue just kind of watching and i guess there's a fucking window in this furnace <laughs> kind of see what's going on and so after a couple minutes he's like pure what i see how many how many jews do we Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, was there another one? They got goofy-ass names. Was there four? There's four people standing in there right now. Well, don't take them out yet, because even if it is their god, maybe he'll run out of magic, and, and they'll eventually burn. You know, like, maybe he can only stave off the flames for so long. So he leaves them in there a couple more minutes to simmer. Becomes clear, god's not going to run out of magic. And so he goes, take those guys out of there. Take them out of there. And so he opens up the furnace. Three, the three, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out totally unscathed. It says they don't even smell of fire. Are they, they naked? Don't even smell like they've been there. No, their clothes were fine too. Ugh. And so they all come out, and all the governors, the satraps, everybody's there. They're looking. And so King Nebuchadnezzar has to pull a World War II Italy, where they switch sides and pretend they've been on that side the entire time. And so he goes, 
wow, your guy's God is really cool. I'm on board. You guys <laughs> don't have to worship this statue. Everyone, we are keeping the statue. It looks awesome. We don't have to pray to it, but you're not getting. No, I don't. We're not getting rid of it. That's fine. You're going to the furnace. You're not protected by their God. We're keeping the statue. Does anyone not want to keep the statue? We're keeping the fucking statue. And so he keeps the statue. And then also he's talking to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and being like, wow, your God's like legit real. My gold statue didn't do anything but shine brightly. And so he asks them about their God. They kind of have a little back and forth. And then because King Nebuchadnezzar still has to appear hardcore, he goes, all right, we're all following the Jewish God now. And any of you, anyone in my kingdom who questions the Jewish God, I will have you and your family cut to pieces and your homes razed to the ground. And everybody's like, 40 minutes ago, we were talking about the statue. <laughs> <laughs> and so everybody unanimously is like, yeah, whatever you say, dude, we're all on board with the Jewish God. I don't want to get cut to pieces. And then to end it all, he gives Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego a raise and a promotion. Ooh. So what did we learn? Uh, um, hopefully I was we're hoping fireproof. For, <laughs> yeah, I was hoping for insight because I didn't learn anything. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at all. At all. It's It's a little similar to David in the lion pit, you know? I David feel like Einstein, yeah. I feel like they maybe they they just recycled that one at some point. You know they probably did. Uh, I you, mean, if you, if you think about it, they're like identical people. stories, right? Except you yeah, got lions they, instead of fire. You think that like one scribe or whatever prophet back in the day was writing that, and the scribe's like, "Oh, this is very similar. I'm British. This is very similar to to." David in the lion's den. He's like, no, it, no, it's not. No, it's not. Name, name 10 similarities. <laughs> I like to think the, the teacher lions, handed out a project and, and she's you. like, no group projects. Yes. <laughs> you guys can't. Did you guys work together on yours? <laughs> mine's got lions. <laughs> no, mine's got a cool statue and, and a king, Nebuchadnezzar. We should run so, both through one of those like... Uh, plagiarism checkers they use in colleges now oh, yeah Let's see if anyone definitely. gets busted that would be funny if it's like the you know jeremiah ripped all of his shit from like Leviticus. <laughs> it, it, it's like that year the end of it that um um the two deep impact and armageddon came out the same year <laughs> yeah you're like wait a fuck what <laughs> what well in ours the asteroid hits wow I, all right. <laughs> what I've learned the most is the more like I read these Old Testament stories and like I've got a couple more stories outlined for the future. I just like doing them in our Just Us Girls chats mm -hmm. is I, I'm not learning anything. I'm not learning any morals, any sort of compass for my life for most of these stories. Really? It's really it's just pretty, like, come on, I, you, you get it though, right? You do. You, you do get it. I get it's, that it's you're about, supposed to praise this God. No, it's about faith under fire. Literally. Yeah, but that's it's not trust in funny. God, no matter what, and and in God real life will, uh, that will doesn't work at all. And yeah, you become no. a martyr. Lots of people get cancer, and they yeah. pray to God like, like, and they uh, believe just as much as these fucks. Well, that was part of God's plan. Yeah, that's a convenient out. That's the truth. Question it, and you can burn too. I, I just feel like if I had put my faith in God instead of my reserve parachute two months ago, this show would be down one host. Yeah, dude. If. If the afterlife is real, and that would have been God's plan. If the afterlife is real, praise his name. Fucking <laughs> Saint Peter next to the pearly gates is going to pull up one of the many YouTube compilations you <laughs> listeners have made of my Bible stories, and I'm going straight to hell. So thanks <laughs> for that. Thanks for that. But it's not real, so don't worry about it. Real. That's the lesson. I'm like ninety nine percent sure. Yeah. If it is, are, real, are you a hundred percent? Or because because I'm only like ninety nine percent. No, I would say I'm like high 90s percent, but if it, yeah. if I die and it turns out it's real, poof, I am not going to be pleased. Me either. And yeah, if I'm you think about it, you, would, you wouldn't risk like, like, like how, how do the seatbelts work in your car? Uh, it says high 90s. <laughs> <laughs> 90, 93, 94% of the time they work. Not really. It, doesn't that concern you? Like, aren't you always worried about it every time you get behind the wheel? Nah. 
no, no, not really. I mean, that was that like they taught us that in school as like an argument to believe in God. It was called Pascal's yeah. wager. And it was, if you believe in God and it doesn't exist, you haven't lost anything. If you believe in God and he does exist, you go to heaven. If you don't believe in God and he doesn't exist, nothing happens. If you don't believe in God and he doesn't exist, you go to hell. So it was like, well, mathematically, you should believe in God. And my thought even then was like, he's going to know I'm faking it. <laughs> like, he's he's going to know that I'm only doing it out of fear of not going to hell. And like, he's that's okay not enough to that. get into heaven. I don't, I don't think so. Based on what I've read, he seems pretty okay with f scaring people into worshiping him. Yeah. Old Testament God was much more into the fear. Jesus was a little nicer. But Jesus also did, uh, well, not even mean funny stuff, like whip people in the uh, when they were like using his, like the Pharisees and Sadducees mm -hmm. were using the church as a like a bartering ground and, and trading and financial place instead of using it as a worship place. He just goes in there and starts cracking the whip on all these Pharisees and overturning their tables. That was a that was fun. Yeah, good for him. I liked that. Yeah, that was a good scene. I brought that up in my uh, my drug class in prison. Um, I don't remember how. Yeah, yeah. The the, the teacher was an absolute <laughs> moron, and uh, and and he brought up something like like he'd get he'd get like really stuck in the mud with the conversations. Like like he'd start arguing with with us, and we knew how to just like drag him down into the mud so he didn't get to teach us anything. And <laughs> something came up teachers. about something came up. I don't remember where it came from, but he he was just like, you know, Jesus. It, would wouldn't would never did anything violent. Jesus was all about peace, and I'm like, what about the time he whipped all those guys? He's like, what are you talking about? The time he went to the where the tax collectors were in the temple, and he whipped the shit out of those people and, and turned their tables over. He's like, oh, well, those yeah. were Jews, and I went. <sighs> You said that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think I just won. <laughs> I looked Dude, around. It was just, it was just three white guys and eight black guys. And I was like, shit, none of them are here to complain about this. Damn it. <laughs> I mean, well, they were Jews, were Jews, but they weren't just Jews. They were Pharisees, Pharisees. and Sadducees, like the bad kind of religious people that were just manipulating the Old Testament into making money. Are you but saying also, like, Jews are the bad kind because they make money? No, the no, Pharisees, they, they, the Pharisees were the bad kind of evil. Yeah, I'm yeah, just, that's why Jesus was so against them. He's the, I choose he was to whipping. believe you said that. And also, like he said, Jesus never did anything violent. There's literally in Matthew a verse that says, "I bring not peace, but a sword." Well, this guy didn't that, know his fucking Bible. That was a metaphor. Not the way I do. Even better than Woody's parents. <laughs> <laughs> and if they want to dispute that, no joke. I think they're in Israel right now. <laughs> That is so fucking funny. <laughs> they're, they're, like, yeah, they're getting extra lessons straight from the source right now. Wait, I would Israel? love. Yeah, so they, like, just they, go walk around Jerusalem. Does she not know that like, like people in Israel aren't Christians? Some are. I, I don't understand. Uh, most of them aren't. Why it's so cool? But yeah, that's like their favorite place to vacation now. They go to Israel probably more than once a year. They it's call me. I mean, if they're not in Israel right now, then they just came home. I wonder, do they have like nice beaches and stuff there? Like they're yeah, right on the Mediterranean. But that's not what they're doing. They're like taking camels and checking out Moses' 40 mile walk or something like that. Yeah, they do oh, have nice beaches, awful. though. I've, I've definitely seen them on the end. Let me, let me try to find a picture. Yeah. Yeah, she really. Uh, in the book, she on Netflix. Sheba's him, which is. She do you, are you familiar with that Bible tale? The story of Bathsheba uh, and King well, David? I mean, I am, but for Kyle's benefit. For Kyle's benefit. Well, it's similar to this. Gather around, kids. So, King David was a king in Israel of Judah after the tribes had broken up. And he was, God, God fucking loved King David. He, he said, you're a man after my own heart. And that means a lot when God's saying it because he also made a ton of shit people that he would never say that to. So, <laughs> it's all about David. David was dope. Did everything right. Eventually, he was up on his, his roof of his palace. While the war was going on, just looking around his kingdom, sees a naked chick in a bath on the roof. She's a fox, and he's he kind of looks at her for a little bit, like masturbates under like the the palisade. As you uh, do, and eventually, as you do, and eventually, after like laying sleepless nights, masturbating furiously, uh, <laughs> hoping God wasn't watching, he eventually is like, "All right, I got to go over there." So he finds out that she's married to this dude named Uriah, and Uriah is a soldier in his army, and they're about to have a big battle. And David goes up to Uriah and he's like, Uriah, oh, dude, just you're just the fucking guy that I was looking for. My God, come with me. Come with me. You 
You are fir- frontline fucking material, man. You are frontline. Show me your arms. Give me a flex. Give me a flex. Yeah, this guy. And so he grabs him and pulls him up to the front. And he sets him there right in the front. And he goes, you're going to defend my homeland for Judah. You know, for Judah. And then, then he goes, but I am going to fight back there because I'm the king. You know how it is. And so he, he backpedals, goes back to where he is, charges in. As they're about to fight, he goes, hey, you know that first contingent up there? Send them in. Send them all in? No, nah, just send that guy. Honestly, just send Uriah. Like, <laughs> just, <laughs> so they, they send that line in. They all just get massacred. Uh, they eventually just fall back. He goes back to his palace, goes to Bathsheba, goes, I'm so sorry. Your husband was tragically and randomly killed in the battle that we didn't even lose that many people. It was a really freak accident. I mean, I think the casualties were one. You know? <laughs> one guy, your husband. You know, shit luck. It's the way she goes. Um, anyway, you want to come over sometime? <laughs> and, and she, knowing that he's the king and that God is all about her, uh, I believe she says yes, eventually. And, uh, and, they, and they fuck. But, but God, Jesus was, God and Jesus, one and the same, they were not happy about that one bit. And so they had to send a priest, Nathan, to David at one point and did the whole Shyamalan twist where Nathan described the whole event of, oh, so, you know, this other, he, he basically says, what would you think about a guy who lusted after another man's wife and sent that guy's wife or his husband, that lady's husband to die in a battle so that you could fuck her? And David was like, that's awful. I would never do that. That's shit. And I think <laughs> you're shit for bringing it up here. You fuck. Haven't you heard to God? God's on my team. And then Nathan goes, and Nathan's a fucking prophet. He had no idea. He had no idea he was a prophet. He just lied to a prophet. That's a big sin. And and he's so ashamed. He's like, oh, God, you just shyamalan me with your prophet, and I totally see what I did wrong. But like, I'm, I still get to go to heaven, right? And God's like, of course. And so that was that was it. But it it's a, it's a <laughs> tale, and it really ties in with what happened here. And I think it was probably an inspiration for I, it. You could make it a YouTube series. I think every PKA, you should tell another British Bible story. <laughs> It's fucking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chiz just said you should make a YouTube series of bridge Bible stories. I'm sure some will love it, but I want to cut myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think Bible stories are so interesting. They are, because it's like you can see, not to say they're all original, but like the the morals that you see there, those are so old and ingrained. It's just cool to see what people thought was good and bad back then, you know? Like today... Like, 100 years from now, people may look at what we think about morality and transgender people now and be like, wow, they were fucking backwards. Or, oh, wow, they really hadn't gotten around to the gays yet. And But, like, you go to now, and a super progressive thinks they're doing the right thing. Back then, like, a super progressive was like, oh, oh, beating your slaves six times? Don't you know there's a five-beat <laughs> maximum, you fuck? Wow, look at him, six, six hits for a slave guy over here. Like, but, and he thought he was progressive. So it's just interesting to see how that moves do you guys know anything about about uh isaac jacob and esau isaac and his sons jacob and esau no they sound like bible names they are absolutely (laughs) bible names they were jews and uh or maybe this was before the whole no they were definitely hebrews hebrews yes so basically this is old testament and so if you hear anything in this where you're like that doesn't sound like jesus be like settle down like it hasn't changed yet uh you know it'll come around to that so basically this is when old school rules apply. Isaac, he was old. He was dying. It was in Jesus, way before Jesus days. And so this is when it was like, oh, you had your kid and you were 72 when you had him because people lived to be super old then. And <laughs> of course they did. And in the Bible, yeah, they lived to be hundreds of years old. I had and no so, idea. Yeah, people like lived very, very long back then. And so like it was like, oh, Isaac beget whoever when he was 82 or like whatever it is. And Isaac was he knew he was going to die soon, and so he's laying in his dying bed, and he goes, you know, to his son Esau, the older one, who was known for being big and hairy and the, the huntsman. And he goes, Esau, I don't know when I'm going to die. I need you to go out. I need you to hunt for some game and then make me a delicious meal. Bring it to me. I'll eat it, and then I'll give you a blessing. I'll bless you this day forward, you know. And so Esau is like, all right, absolutely. I have to go do this because this isn't like a blessing of like, you know, you know, hail Mary, no. full of grace. This is like this is a real deal blessing. Like it's an actual. Think of there it like some a anointing. Spell. Yeah, this was not a. I give you good luck. It was like a spell of power, basically. Think of it. Because like, let me ask you, like, like the who's the character who's in the bed dying? His name is Isaac. 
Isaac is like tight with God, right? So a blessing yeah. from Isaac is de facto a blessing from God in, in some ways. Yeah, I just you need to establish to get this in, the intensity of the story that this is a blessing of like I bless you to be guaranteed to go on and do great shit and be successful. Oh, that's not way a, better than sneezing. Yes, it's not a bless you child. You know, now I die. <laughs> and, so, and so as he tells Esau this, Esau is in there and he goes, okay, I, I promise you, father, I'm going to go get that get that game, make you a meal, bring it back. Rachel, who was one of Isaac's wives. Uh, or Rebecca, sorry, who was one of Isaac's wives, was outside of this room, and she heard that. And so she goes to her son, Jacob, and she goes, Jacob, he's about to give away this blessing, and Esau's out there hunting. We got to work. We got to go right now. We got to get this blessing right now. You go. You find. You get two animals from our, our stock. Bring them in here. I'll kill them. I'll make the meal real quick, and then you go deliver it to him. And Jacob goes, that's all well and good. I'd love to usurp that blessing. But problem is, I am a smooth man. And Esau is hairy. Even if, even though Isaac is going blind, he's still gonna gonna recognize me. This speaks volumes to the intellectual capacity of people back in this day. No, hang on, let me jump in because I got a theory as to how this could be true. I think that he's blind, right? I I think that the father is blind at this point. Isaac is so old that he's going like he's like having to squint. He can barely see anything. He can't see them, so he knows his sons by touch. He, you know, you take a just like remember Ray Charles. You know, he 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 had to he had to get rid of the fatties, right? So when he met a woman, he'd take her hand and he'd wrap his hand around her wrist, not her hand, and he could tell by putting his hand around her wrist if this lady was fat or not. So I think we got a similar thing here. He's feeling for that hairy arm, and he knows who he's got. Kind of like that, where. Jacob goes, I'm, I'm a smooth man. My brother's hairy. He's going to know. She, Rebecca's like, no, no excuses. We're making sure you get this blessing because you're my only kid. And so we, we're not letting this hairy fucker Esau get it. And so he goes, fine. He goes and he gets the, the animals, brings them back, slaughter them. She's cooking them up. And he goes, I'm not, when I go in there, there's, he's still going to know it's me. Like, it's my voice. I'm not hairy. And so she goes, I'm gonna, go get two goat skins and drape it over your neck and then over your hands. Over your hands, yucky. As if feeling goat skin on someone's hands, whatever. And so he <laughs> puts the goat skin on. He goes into Isaac's uh, Isaac's hut, and he goes, "Father, I'm, I'm here." And he and he, ah! Esau, is that you, my son? You you sound of Jacob. And he's like, "Oh no, no, no! It's definitely me. Definitely me, Esau, the guy you told to get food." Oh well, I did tell you that, and you know, and Jacob wasn't around. I trust you. Come, come closer. Come closer. And he touches his hands with his old man fingers, and he goes, "Ah, my donkey-handed son is here. <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 my hairy, ah, hairy wharf, son. Ah, Worf, you've come back to me. <laughs> yes." <laughs> So, oh, you're here, you're here. Well, all right, give me my food. And so, so he sits down, he starts feeding Isaac the food, helping him eat, gets Isaac some wine, lets him, lets him drink it. And, and after he finishes it, Isaac goes, are, are you really Esau? Because <laughs> even, this, <laughs> even this blind man was not convinced by this masterful ruse. And... Yeah. And he goes, yeah, yeah, you're, I'm definitely Esau. And so he goes, you sound just like Jacob, though. Like, you sound <laughs> just like him. Like, I'm blind, not deaf. And he goes, okay, give me one more stroke of the hands. He gets one more hand stroke, and he goes, all right, I'm good. I, I, I believe it's Esau now. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he gets one more, uh, one more hands <laughs> of Esau touch, and Isaac goes, all right, prepare for your blessing. And he says, I want to find the actual blessing here so you and can so hear he what it was. Over. Yeah. So he said... Come near me and kiss me, my son. And so he kissed him, his son. He smelled Esau's furs and the hunt, huntsmen upon him. So he was comfortable giving the blessing. And this is the blessing. He said, see, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. Wow. Well, that's you a cover, fucking powerful you, blessing. You yeah. cover a lot of bases with that. Wow. Mm. A lot those of bases. who don't like you, they're fucked. Those who are tight with you, oh, those go, they, they get risen up too. Oh. Everything you want is yours. You even smell good, bro. You smell it, nice. It facilitates an awesome, dope life for him. And so as Jacob is leaving, you know, like 30 yards away, Esau's coming in with the stuff that he just hunted. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and, and cooked and made. Like, he fucking slaughtered stuff out there, made a pot, made a fire, made all this shit. And, <laughs> and, and Jacob and is, like, is like taking those furs off real quick, throwing them behind the hut, and then running back into the house behind his mom. And Esau walks up, and he, he goes into to Isaac's tent. Esau goes, Father, arise, arise, eat of this meal I've prepared for you so that you may bless me. And Isaac, with that look on his blind, you know, oh, I've been hoodwinked face, goes, but who was it that brought me food just a moment ago? I've already given your blessing. Who was that? And of course, Esau's like, are you shitting me? Like, are you, are you shitting me? Like, someone already came and get this? Like, there's only so many of us in the world right now. It had to be Jacob. Was it a woman? Was it a woman? No, then it was Jacob. It was fucking Jacob. There's not a lot of us here. So I narrowed it down. So, and, and so he, he says to his father, Isaac, he says, you know what? Okay, I understand. Like, I, 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 he's, he's violent, like shaking. He's so mad. But he goes, Father, you must have another blessing. You must have another backup blessing. Yeah, does he have short that you of blessings? Gonna... He just says them. That's the thing. He says, you know, Father, please bless me. Please give me a blessing. I need something. I've done this for you. And Isaac, like a fucking Radio Shack, no returns, no matter what employee, is sitting there going, I'm sorry. I can't. There is no more blessing for you. There's none. I can't give it. And Esau's yeah. like, this is ridiculous. Like, you can just give me a blessing. And Isaac, apparently being clued into God, is like, no. The words have been said. Uh, the spell has been cast. Your, your brother is blessed, and you are not. You and want me to go to God and tell him I didn't recognize my own son that I was trying to bless? You think he's going to give me some more blessing mojo if I tell <laughs> yeah. him I gave the wrong fucking son of mine the, 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 the blessing? Yeah. Never there again were... will he give me mojo. <laughs> He'll never give me another blessing pr privilege when he finds out that... I gave it to literally the only other person that I could have accidentally given it to. <laughs> and, so, and so basically, Isaac eventually says to his son Esau, he says, I, I'm so sorry, I can't bless you. And he tells him this. He says, uh, uh, what then can I do for you, my son? Have you but, oh, he's asking, have you but one blessing, my father? And Isaac says, behold. Away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from, his, from your neck. And so he didn't only not get a blessing, he got like a spelled out prescription for how much his, relative, or his ancestors are going to have to serve Jacob, the shitty brother who stole who stole his inheritance from him, that blessing, which is basically the inheritance that you get from a god-man. Hey, that's not where the Arabs came from, is it? Uh, or is that a different chapter. Bible story? This is a okay. later chapter. Yes, yes. I think that might be Cain and Abel you're thinking of. Um, I but, thought that was the black uh, people. Esau and, oh, maybe. But yeah, that was. there will be more to this story as I continue with Isaac and Jacob in later chapters. But... <laughs> Man, like I had to, I had to reread it to like get the full story again today because I haven't thought about it in a long time. Yeah, I remember. I that would be the goat skin. livid, livid if I was Esau and I found out that I didn't even like. I, someone stole my blessing, and then also I don't even get like a thanks for coming blessing. Like so the way my preacher, success. the way my preacher explained that is, it is um, he said he was blind, of course, and that those goat skins, like it's not just about feeling the hair, but he had the scent that, that like the huntsman scent. From those goat skins he was wearing, he smelled like the right son in, in the hoodwinking portion of the story. And of course, they weren't like goat skins with like goo on the other side, so there's no confusion. You know, it's like it was more like a fur blanket. Yeah, mm. but man, like insult to injury. Being not that any like, of this ever happened, of course. <laughs> no, but yeah, if you pretend it does, then it makes this it is more like fun. this is no different than us discussing that episode of House of Cards, right? Like, and then <laughs> yeah. he fucking pushed her in front of the subway train, and he became the president, dude. But this is so much spoiler cooler. alert, season this two. Is, <laughs> this is so much cooler than House of Cards because their story, the stories are because old as shit. True? Oh, my bad. Like it's <laughs> so old that it's like I don't know. You can see morality like almost forming, and like yeah. the way like back then. It clearly was not the God yet of the New Testament, which is like the omnipotent, omniscient, good God who's trying to like help out and shit. Like this is still when it's like just getting started. This is Genesis 27, I think. I wrote it down. Yeah, Genesis 27 is this story. So it's real early on, and they're still in that mode of like our tribal deity, you know? So even God, like when he finds out like, oh, hey, I, sorry, God, I accidentally gave the wrong blessing. Can you give me another one? Even God is like a, a fickle tribal God of like, no, you fucked it up. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. You know, yeah, he's suffer. a smaller god. He's definitely a smaller god. He's not lord of the universe and commander of the stars. He's more like 
that guy we're really tight with who does a little magic. Yeah, it's it's it, he does a little magic. <laughs> Let me tell you about thirty book. seconds of regret, there, son. Yeah. <laughs> Men for ages will experience that. <laughs> Man, this these Bible stories. It's the only way to live a good life. <laughs> I, I still want to. I still want to hear like uh, some the, the, more about Jonah and the whale because I don't think I actually ever heard ha, heard or have read the the the, the Bible verses like no, like the. the real, real, do you want me to tell you uh, Jonah? Um, no, because I I know the basic story. I, 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 but 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 I want to. I, I, are you prepared to tell the story of Jonah? I, <laughs> I know. I know, I, I know enough about Jonah you. to 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 say it. Maybe you can fill stuff in. So basically, Jonah is was one of those prophets, right? Where prophets had a ton of power back then. They were just God's messengers. And so God went to Jonah and said, "Hey, I need you to go to Nineveh and tell them that literally everything they're doing in their lives every day is evil. And if they don't stop, I'm going to destroy this entire city and kill all of them." And Jonah goes, honestly, there's not a good track record of people who show up in Nineveh telling them not to do this shit. <laughs> like, almost, like, literally, yeah, all of them die. They all get crucified or murdered or something horrible or drawn and quartered. Like, I'm not going to go be that guy in Nineveh. Screw that. And so, obviously, Jonah is like, I'm running away. I'm running away from God and from home. And so he goes down to the docks, pays a fee to get on there, doesn't fully explain who he is. Uh, they, they know he's a prophet, but they're not of the Judeo, the Jewish, Jewish religion. And so they don't really care. You know, they're doing their own thing. They say, all right, come on board. He hops on board. They start sailing across just away from Nineveh. He doesn't know where he's going. He's just trying to get away from Nineveh. They get out there in the middle of the waters and the, the most heinous storm breaks out that to the point that even though Jonah is down below, everybody up top is throwing a fit. They're freaking out. They're all like weathered sailors trying to survive. And Jonah's down there sleeping. And so someone comes down there and goes, Jonah, you're sleeping. Like, this isn't, you know, a fucking Ramada 2,000 years from now. You got to get up here and help out. <laughs> like, this is getting out of control. Come on, come on. And so he goes up there, and the whole time it's like, it's like Jonah is the guy who clogged the toilet that nobody knows it was him, and he's yeah. trying to help <laughs> clean up the mess to where he's like, you know, he knows it's him, and he's, he's like, yeah, it is totally gross. Like, what, who did this? And, like, trying to clean it up. <laughs> And he's trying to help, and eventually they're like, uh, they they get clued in a little bit more because they realize Jonah, you you ran, so you you were running away from responsibility with your God, like you had to do something for your God, and you said no, and you ran away, and now you're on this boat with us <laughs> in the ocean, you did that, and Jonah's like, I know, like hindsight's twenty twenty, <laughs> <laughs> and so Jonah is like, I'm I'm so sorry about this, guys, like I, I'm still a man of my God. And, and so, you know, we got to, we got to, we'll, we'll do, we'll work on something else. You know, let's throw everything overboard first. And so they start throwing everything overboard that they don't need to survive for like one more day to get to shore. It's still not enough to keep them afloat. And so they start casting lots, which is just rolling dice to see who is going to be the person that they throw overboard because they have run out of weight and they have to get this. It's either one of us dies for sure, or we all end up dying. And so they cast lots and as they're doing it, Jonah's like, stop. I'm jumping off the boat. This is my fault. As soon as I jump off, you guys should be okay. God wants me, not you. And they're like, like doing that thing of like, oh man, are you sure? Like, hey, like, please don't. No. <laughs> hey, you come back here, Jonah. Don't you make us twist your arm? You know, as he's like <laughs> jumping over into the water. And so he jumps over into the water. Instantly, instantly, storm subsides, stops. What happens beneath the waters that you don't know? All the people that were on the boat are just, you know, they continue about their merry way, having been basically transitively proselytized to that the Jewish God is the true God. And so... they and scary. You know, and very, very frightening, which is important in tribal gods. Mm. They, go on, they go on out. Jonah's in the water. God sends a giant fish, not a whale, because they didn't know that whales were not giant fish. They send a giant fish, swallows up Jonah. That's the part that everybody's familiar with. For three days and three nights... He lived in the fish's stomach, basically in like, if you look at ancient drawings of this, you see what they imagined these beasts' stomachs to look like, almost like uh, like Woody's East Sunroom is what one of these <laughs> things look like. Like just a very nice, spacious, you know, not too many organs, you know, mucking up the works, crowding it. It's just very, very nice. And so right. he stayed there three days and three nights until eventually the fish vomits him back up 
pretty much right where he left off as a way for God to be like, oh, look who's back. <laughs> and so he throws him up. God tells him again. He goes, hey, Jonah. So we're not, we're not going to get into stuff. We both know what you did. You tried to run away. Like, I figured you knew I was God, and I would find you. Like, this, this is a lesson that you should have known. You are a prophet. Um, seriously, though, I need you to get to Nineveh and tell them that everything <laughs> that you're doing is going to cause them imminent death. I will destroy them if they don't stop having sex and sacrificing animals to Baal or whatever, you know, other gods that they were, you know, golden calves and the like. And this time, Jonah's like, I, I have no option. I got to go. I got to go to Nineveh. So he goes to Nineveh. As he gets there, um, this is almost like a, a bit of a Shyamalan twist to this story. He goes in, gets up on his pedestal, shaking so nervous because he knows what happened to every other person who goes into Nineveh and says, right, like, get, like it'd be like going on Bourbon Street and trying and like stealing beers out of people's hands. Like, it's not going to happen. Like, you're, someone's going to, you know, bottle you or something. And so he gets up there, starts spreading the word, saying, guys, if you don't stop, God's going to kill all of you forever and your city will be gone. Mir miraculously, all of them look around and almost have a communal, like, well, we had a good run, didn't we, Nineveh? Like, we <laughs> really got raucous, quite a bit of debauchery, sex, animals, the whole nine, you know, but let's, let's call it quits. This is the same guy who got swallowed by a whale, according to that other fisherman who, you know, we all trust Jeff, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so, and so then they all actually listen. The whole city of Nineveh takes it to heart and says, we are going to follow God. We're going to get rid of this sin. And so at the end of it, Jonah comes out looking like a real retard because the whole time God knew that Nineveh was going to come around. And it was almost like it was a test for Jonah's faith, you know? But it does seem like they only came around because Jonah defied God and, and experienced the whole whale thing and, and let some, some Nineveh or wherever the fuck people see that God was real, right? Ah, but you can't look that far into it. God cheated his own system. Like, like he, he's up there like, no, I'm not going to fucking make any magic for you to see so you'll worship me. Well, I might yeah. this time, though. Just, uh, maybe this time. It's, he, he's ridiculous like that, that God. You know, he's always doing the pulling Because if he really wanted us to sign on board, right, he, all he's got to do is show up. Like, I, I don't even need, like, a seminar. Like, like, this doesn't have to be, like, a Tony Robbins thing where it goes on for hours and I'm in the audience like, yeah, he's really winning me over. Like, I need a paragraph from this guy. Yeah. Just just make a make an appearance. Be like, float down. <laughs> How are you gonna... pulling all this out, though? Like, like where, like, did you, like, do you, like, into Bible study? Or did you go to a, a like, what? How did you just pull that out? Oh, uh, these are things so Taylor knows. I went to, I went to a private school, like a religious school. For a lot when I was younger, and so I knew I know all the boilerplate tales and mm. such because I've been told them so many times. Yep. And I, as I was like in mid-teens, late teens, I got more into like looking into it, trying to figure it out. And so I just like read through the Bible, and and you know you pick a lot of it up when when you read it. And then yeah. if you actually get an interest in it, it's like this is you know these are pretty interesting stories. It, like, I don't know any us. of it really, or remember any of it. I guess yeah. you could say so. That you could be making you for second most knowledgeable. In the yeah. podcast, <laughs> we right? had coloring books for this stuff. Like <laughs> you, you could really be, hammer home these points and the reason. You could God be it making this. shit up for all I know, but you said it was such conviction uh -huh. and like, like just your like pacing on it and everything. I'm like, oh yeah, may, well may, maybe that did happen. Yeah. Maybe it did. <laughs> maybe it did. Man, fuck, man. I, 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 I mean, was gonna. Maybe something. I was gonna go lobster in August, but fuck it. Now I ain't going near the ocean. <laughs> he slipped shit in there and he's like, yeah, hindsight's 2020. And I'm like, they said that? Well, I guess he said that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I guess, I guess, yeah, there's a lot of uh, modern phrases in the Bible. Yeah, you guys, you know? I mean, you don't know about. Tell me about Jesus. Tell me. Well, Jesus, you could go on forever <laughs> because lots of tales about that guy. And, uh, but yeah, these, these obscure, more Old Testament tales, you can tell most of them. And if you get like 20% of it wrong, most people have no fucking idea. Like maybe one person will be like, actually, it was a, a, a different, uh, that was Elisha, not Elijah in that mm. story or something like that. But anyway, Elisha that's enough. Elisha become Elijah? No, Elisha is Elijah's protege. Bruce became. Okay, Wh which, one, which, who was the guy whose name changed when, he, when, he, when, he, when, when, God, when God came into his life? Like, like he just became uh, another Saul, guy. Saul became Paul. Okay, thank you. That's yeah, a New so. Testament thing, yeah. I knew the name sounded alike. It was like they didn't change it much, you know? Yeah. So. Saul used to persecute <laughs> Christians, and then God came to him, changed him into Paul, then he became one of the great proselytizers, you know, of, of the era. But the end.
not not the end. There's a lot more pages. <laughs> <laughs> Just books and books. Right. Yeah, God's pretty yeah. shitty in that in the in that book. Like he's always playing favorites. Like like modern oh, Christianity yeah. is all about how God loves all of us, all of us so much. Like they they hammer that home endlessly. God loves you so much, you you, and no matter what you do, He'll still love you that much. That's why He gave His only Son, just just so you wouldn't have to sacrifice a goat to ensure that you get to go to His everlasting kingdom of heaven. That's what it was all about, you know, because you. And your evil sin that's part of you. And it's like, yeah, but there's plenty of times in there that he was a real dick, right? Like like just like a like a like a petulant child. Uh, yeah. a guy who like played favorites to the point where like if you saw that happen in politics, you'd be like, ah, oh, this is fucking horseshit. Like who was the <laughs> warrior king who was who like you you told the story before. There's the warrior king, maybe David. David is it David yeah. who sends the, the soldier off to war so he can get with the guy's wife? Yeah. And God's like, you know, all, all's fair in love and war, I guess, saith the Lord. Like, God like shows. <laughs> so this is this a regular thing you guys do? Occasionally. Uh, once a month. Yeah, least, every yeah. once in a while. I'll, I'm going to start doing it more because I think they're fun. <laughs> yeah, Bible stories are good. That, I mean, like, I, like, there was no, like, hesitation, no, like, lull in that story. I was like, oh, wow. Well, he's, he's got like, notes. Did I see, <laughs> did I see something? Not for, I not for Jonah. I, had I know. To take you, yeah, you knew Jonah Isaac notes. Yeah. But, um, yeah, God fucked up on accident a lot in the Bible. <laughs> no, you can see, like, one of his first fuck-ups with the Tower of Babel, where everybody on Earth was speaking the same language and was working together to build the Tower to Heaven, and God saw it, and it was almost like he built a custom Civ game, and he's like, damn it, I forgot to set the settings right, and now everybody's getting along. Uh, all right, uh, break up the languages, go in different areas. Okay, all right, we're good. And yep. so there's just a part of the Bible where it clearly he fucked up and they were all speaking French or whatever. And so he had to like invent a bunch of shit and break everybody up, get them, get them fighting. Otherwise, God it's just a peaceful mistakes. story. The whole way through, God makes mistakes and errors and he plays favorites and he's jealous and he's angry and he's wrathful and he's petty. Petty to no end when you consider that he's supposed to be a God. Like he's petty for us. He is petty for a human being. It's uh, Those are the upsetting parts. He's a jealous Bible. God. Yeah. He is a jealous, and, and you hear that, and 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 I'm I'm saying this for you other two's sake. Like these are things you hear in church. He is a jealous God. He is yeah, a wrathful like God. Like you need to know. Aren't a couple of them just about loving? Thou shalt not worship false idols. Enough. Yeah, no other gods, no idols. Shall come before me. Uh, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Yeah. Um, uh, it's like honor the Sabbath. Um, no murder, no stealing. See now those um, get don't with, but, but adulterate my wife. It seems like you know, <laughs> two or three of those things are just about loving me more. Like if they yeah, are like, commandments, like thirty percent of them are devoted to just fucking. So much really of the Bible is, is there's there are, so there much are fluff huge in that list. <laughs> there are huge moments in the Bible where like everything stops because because God doesn't feel loved enough. Like like Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, right? And and, and they're down there worshiping the calf, and he smashes them. It, it, there's there's tons of like just people getting angry and like going like like what did God? I always wondered like. How did God feel about that, right? Like when Moses smashes the Ten Commandments. Like, nah, he like, made new ones. He did, didn't he? Yeah, he hmm. made them new Like, just, But it, it, it betrays the time, you know, because it's like back in the day, you didn't want your tribal God to be the all-loving, all-caring, once everybody is part of your group. Like, no, yeah. you want your God to be the insular, containing, we are powerful, we are mighty, fear us kind of God. Because guaranteed those Ammonites over there, their God doesn't want anything to do with Fucking you. Their Hittites. God is a ferocious war God who wants them to succeed and, and drink your blood or whatever. So, like, to be tribal like that, you need a God that's fierce. And yeah. See? It, there you that, go that's again. That's you got stories about the walls of Jericho and like what what we did to the I say we what the what the Hebrews did to the Hittites and the, all of those it, when when God decided that you were no good and then He got behind His people like there's this story after story of like cities being smoked and and God will like enumerate like what He wants done He won't just be like they're against us they must die He'll be like and their children and their goats <laughs> yeah. and if you see a baby goat that was born on that morn and he is then he was born to evil so you slaughter the baby goat as you would the adult goat and he's like all this backwards talking that's like a metaphor for kill everything and everyone and salt the fields like yeah. he's not a friendly kumbaya kind of god he's like you said he is he's a war god you know and and, and more often than not he's all about destroying our enemies or protecting us yeah which but is then what when they you needed. get in when you get into like the what was it, Eastern Roman Empire with Constantine, 
and he politicized Christianity as the official religion of the empire. I wonder that was, about that was post That was post-Jesus. Because Constantine— when it was more like, everybody come into our, our fold and be a part of our team because I, I have this vast empire, and so obviously it's better if we can try and get everybody on the same page with some of this shit, you know? I, it, from the stories, it almost seems like Constantine was like, like maybe in like a fever dream was converted for reals, though, right? Because he saw the, the cross in the air, right? Yeah, he, said, uh, before he the rode next, into battle. And then he rode into battle the next day with the crosses on his shields, I think, and they fucking won when they weren't supposed to win. And he was like, oh, Rome is Christian now. Yeah. <laughs> then you get the, yeah. then the popery leads from there. Yep. The papacy. Not the kind that smells good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> popery. That's funny. <laughs> the kind that fondles children, not the kind that smells nice in your grandma's house. I feel like the popes aren't actually fondling children. They delegate. I bet the work. old ones were. Oh, mm. those old pups, popes were like fucking vicious warlords. Like there are some scary popes back in the day. There were popes torturing people and, and, and fucking bitches. Like there's been all kinds of hardcore popes. Some of the popes <laughs> were like through history were like, like if there's a list of the top hundred people, most powerful pe human beings of all time for their era, considering all those things. Like, you know, if there's, if there's a point in history where there's 20 million people in existence and this guy ruled over six million of them, then he's a lot more powerful than Donald Trump is today, probably, right? Like, he just had he had complete sway over one-third of the population of human yeah, beings. Yeah. He's, just, he's more powerful by a fact. Trump just has influence. Yeah, and some of those popes fall into that category. Like, guys who were, they're like, yeah, he's the pope. He talks to God. That's where he just came from. He was talking to God. He's going to relay that to us, and we either do it or we burn in hell for all eternity. It's pretty simple around here. You know, if you're living like that, then eh, kings it's and queens bow down to the pope. In the church, like, I, I wish I could know what their real, true, honest feelings are, right? Because you mentioned, right? Like, hey, God comes down here and does a little magic trick. I'm on board, right? Just come give me something, and, and, and I'll believe in God as much as I believe in, you know, all my other neighbors and stuff, right? Like, because they're real. So let's say that you're like a cardinal or something, right? You're 76 years old. You've still never seen any evidence of God. Unless you stretch it, stretch it so much to believe that like, you know, like <laughs> I broke my window and then I found money between the couch cushions and that was an act of God because it paid for the damage. Like if you really stretch it, you know, to, to, to think that any good act or any good thing that happened was, was a, you know. Or blessing. that if you prayed and then that out and then you, that outcome came out positively, then that was God. And, oh, but of course, if you prayed and the outcome doesn't come out positive, then it was part of his plan and mm -hmm. you just need to, to pray harder. A Bible tale, a story oh, of. Uh, you know, I do. Oh, I thought you were asking to end the call, to which I was going to say, no, no. <laughs> no. Uh, well, I, I, was, I was asking because if you, if you had said like three minutes and – or three hours and 50 minutes, I'd be like, okay, we can end on a Bible tale. But it's not going to be half hour, so we'll just tell it now. Then. I still want so the Bible tale. We talked about Elisha some last week. You guys remember? He's one of the Jew wizards known as prophets from the mm. Old Testament who – Magic things. He's the guy who they called him bald head, bald head, all the children, you know, in the town. And then he summoned the two bears to slaughter the children and told them, you know, that'll, that'll show you to be a little snarky from now on. And so that seemed like an am I the asshole story where he was totally an <laughs> asshole. And so I wanted to even it out a little bit. Like Elisha couldn't have been that bad. God gave him superpowers. And so here's a, a better side of Elisha. Mm -hmm. So and it, it is a more obscure Bible tale, so a lot of people won't know this one. So there's a guy named Naaman, and Naaman was a general for Syria, or Assyria, whatever the fuck it was back then. And they didn't get along great with Israel. Uh, if you read the Old Testament, it's pretty much just over and over Israel being like, and then we ran into the Moabites, and they were total assholes until we <laughs> conquered them. And then we ran into the Ammonites, and even bigger assholes until we conquered them. And... Just kind of that story. But they weren't getting along at the time, and Israel had the lower hand. He was more powerful. And this guy, Naaman, had leprosy. And leprosy, obviously, very bad. I don't fully understand how you can be, like, a general and have leprosy, because I feel like it's super, super contagious, and anybody would get it. But he did. He had leprosy, and he wanted to try and get it cured. They tried everything. Honey rubs, you know, goat uh, milk, all, all the things, all the, all the classics. And nothing worked. And so he goes to his king, I'm going to go seek out the king of Israel because that dude has this guy Elisha on, in his bench, and he's magic. He's an actual magic man who might be able to save me from leprosy, so I'm going to go give it a go. And so this guy reaches out to the king of Israel and goes, hey, I'm coming over. Don't panic. 
just coming over for a bit. If you could hook me up with Elisha and try and heal me, that would be awesome. And the king of Israel is like, this is so shady bullshit. Like, there's no way he's coming over. He's going to come try and conquer us. And Elisha overhears the message that was sent to the king of Israel and goes, hey, just send him straight to me. Just send him straight to me. It's going to be fine. Send him to my little hovel, my hobbit home, wherever I live. And so this guy, Naaman, brings gifts, chariots, gold, spices, all the stuff. All the stuff that you want back in the day. And he shows up at Elisha's house, waiting there. He's got leprosy. The boils are so sore. He's been walking over the desert all day. Imagine doing that in bullshit sandals and, and <laughs> covered in pustules and boils with a necrosis occurring on your little appendages. And he's waiting out there, waiting. You know, Elisha, Elisha, are you coming out? Elisha, sitting in there, tells his servant to go out and tell him, hey, I'm not available. I got a lot of stuff going on right now, so I'm not coming out. You're not going to see me. Just go bathe in the Jordan River seven times, and you'll be fine. And Naaman is pissed. He's like, I just brought shit. Look at how much, how many people are here right now, and how many chariots, and how many things. I brought all of this just to be like, just I. He, he told him, like, I expected you to come out and wave your hands and place hands on me and get rid of this leprosy, and instead you tell me to go take a dunk seven times in a dirty river? miles from here it's ridiculous i'm going home and so naaman's about to head back and of course apparently one of his servants had seen a netflix series at one point because he's like no dude this is obviously like a woo gotcha kind of thing that he's doing so let's give it a go we're gonna stop at the jordan river on the way back either way we have to cross it just dunk yourself fuck and <laughs> so they get to the river he dunks himself seven times and he comes out pristine clean as ever completely cured and he is like so he's elated he tries to again to send all the gifts to elijah you know so just give it to him i don't care what he says just make sure that guy gets it this is the best like i'm not gonna die i'm great like praise to the israel god sends him all the gifts and elisha again says no no i'm not taking any gifts take him back and so naaman's like whatever dude fine and so he takes all the gifts back brings him home the guy doesn't have leprosy what uh Elisha's servant then does is some really sketchy bullshit. He goes to Naaman and says that whole gift thing. Hilarious, hilarious story. He thought that you wanted a gift from him and he said he didn't have one, but we definitely want all those gifts. We want all of them. All those gifts you brought the other day, I'll, I'll lead him back there. I'll bring him back, okay? And, the, and Naaman's like, okay, cool. Yeah, I trust you. You just saved my life, so take it. Take the chariots and the gold and whatever and keep it. And this guy, Elisha's servant, ends up keeping all of it from Elisha and doesn't t tell him that he took that gift. And so this guy's now loaded off of his ass, off of a bunch of stuff that he didn't do for Elisha. Elisha, of course, is a wizard of sorts, a prophet. And so he, he figures this out. I don't know what the servant thought he was going to do, by pulling the wool over this guy's eyes, who just cured <laughs> leprosy. <laughs> he just cured somebody's leprosy, and he's like, this is the guy to screw. Like, fuck this guy. And so he gets it. Elisha finds out, brings him in. It's almost like he's getting fired, you know, where you get called into the office, and it's quiet, and it's, you know... We've had a lot of discussions in the past about issues of behavior. Uh, you've read our code of conduct and our ethics policy. You know who, <laughs> how we do things here at Jews Incorporated, and this is not how we do it and the servant expecting just to get fired or let go like oh i can't help this old wizard man anymore with his daily duties uh in between curing people and elisha flips the script and goes actually you're gonna get leprosy <laughs> <laughs> and he goes actually no that's not it all of your descendants will have leprosy now get out of my house. <laughs> and so this servant, for stealing stuff, gets venge leprosy from a prophet, and that's not even enough. It's if you do manage to get laid with your necrotic leprosy cock, that kid's <laughs> popping out like, you know, uh, covered in welts and boils and whatnot. Like your whole livelihood is ruined. It's all for nothing. And, and there's no chapter in later books where they revisit it. And they say, you know what? It's been years. You've learned your lesson, haven't you? And he goes, oh, my tongue fell out. But I said, it was that and then he goes, okay, fine. They cure him. Like, no, it doesn't happen. They just let him die of leprosy. So really, he didn't even cure leprosy. He just transferred it to another soul. 
That's what now, at the start yeah. of it, you said, hey, I'm going to point a, you know, paint a lace in a kinder light. I, I'm not if sure you, you did that. If you cut out the last few lines, it's as positive <laughs> as a one she gets. <laughs> those, old those Old Testament prophets, like the stories they tell you about them in, the, in Sunday school are not – the interesting stories with those prophets. They'll tell you the ones of like, oh, and then he came out and he, you know, uh, there's blindness and he put his hands on the guys and the scales fell from his eyes and he was able to see once more. They never tell you the fun shit about bears attacking the children or vengeful leprosy given out by a madman who won't accept <laughs> gifts from an enemy general who he cures of leprosy. Um, and to be fair, the end game of all of this is that Israel conquered um, Moab those those people there in Syria or whatever it was. So mm -hmm. in the end, it's like, hey, you, you don't have any leprosy, but we're coming to kill you in like three weeks anyway. And that did end up happening, and they slaughtered 10,000 in the city and conquered it uh, for 80 years. So it did pan out for yeah. Israel. Yeah, that's all that matters. Yeah, it, uh, it, that's the thing with Bible stories in the Old Testament. If you take off like the last 15, 16%, <laughs> they're very uplifting. Uh, do you guys want to hear about Moses? Oh, yes. And the story no, therein? Now, Queb, you come from a heathen place far, far away where yes. you don't follow the scriptures. So the what? some of this, the scriptures of the Lord, the, the Bible and shit. I'm just being no. a dick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so this is a very long story. So I'm going to have to abridge some certain parts. I mean, so I know Moses, Moses. You know of Moses. Okay. Yeah. So you know, you know who he is. So Moses was a Jew and he was born a slave in Egypt. And right in his generation of being born, the Jews were prol proliferating so much in Egypt that the Pharaoh at the time was like, there are way too many Hebrews being born. If they decide to revolt, we're kind of up Shit's Creek because we've had them here for a couple hundred years and they're really starting to multiply. So what we're going to do is we're going to kill all the firstborn males that are under like two years old. And so he sent his soldiers out to pretty much every little hut everywhere, starts killing all of the little babies, pulling them from their mother's teat, all the rest. And Moses' mother is like, fuck, I can't let this happen. So she takes some tar, puts it around a, a wicker basket, mm -hmm. and then puts Moses in there, hands the basket to her daughter, Moses' older sister, and goes, go and put this in the Nile River quick before the guards get here. We can't let them know. So she runs over to the Nile, puts, puts Moses in, and then kind of hides in the reeds and watches and before too long, you know, dodging crocodiles and hippos and whatever else was there in olden days, makes it to a bank, kind of gets stuck in some reeds near the palace of, of the pharaoh. And the pharaoh's daughter comes down, sees the basket, curious, picks it up, opens it up, sees a little Hebrew boy in there. And she's like, oh my God, so cute, so cute. And so she picks up the baby, goes back to the palace, and she's like, dad, dad. Can I keep it? I know literally <laughs> last night, literally last night at dinner, you were like, we got to kill all the little Hebrew boys. But what is one, one little baby Jew going to do? Please, can I keep it? Please, 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 dad, please. She's, he's like, all right, you can keep the one baby Jew, but that's it. No more. She goes, thank you so much. It's all I ever wanted. And so uh, they raise Moses as uh, an Egyptian prince. But of course, Moses knows the whole time as he's being raised, you know, you are a Hebrew. That's who you are. But we're raising you special. Uh, and so on and so forth. And so Moses was kind of given better jobs. So while the rest of all the Jews and Hebrews were slaving away building pyramids or whatever they were doing, he was kind of like an overseer. And one, one day out there on the workforce, he was overseeing uh, an Egyptian slave master berating and disciplining uh, one of the Jews. And this slave master got so out of hand that he beat that Jew to death. And Moses lost his mind and proceeded to go into like a blackout, beats that Egyptian to death. And he stands up, and that Egyptian's dead. Meanwhile, like, his fists are bloody, and he's... <laughs> and all the other Jews standing around him are like, Moses, the fuck? We're the ones who are going to pay for this, dude. Like, you're in a good enough place. Like, we're in trouble. Moses like, I, I get it. Totally my bad. But I got a piece, because I'm out of here. Like, they're going to kill me. And so he starts going into the desert, trying to get away. That's where the burning bush story happens. I'll tell that very quickly. He comes across the bush. The bush, bush goes, Moses... Hey, it's me. And he goes, oh, oh. He goes, oh, no, it's just God. And he goes, oh, all right. And, and the bush goes, Moses, I put you in that position for a reason. You got to go back and release them from slavery. And Moses is like, they're going to kill me. And God's like kind of implying like, I'll fucking kill you. 
And so he's like, all right, well, those are two sure things. At least the Egyptians, I might be able to sweet talk. So he heads back. He goes back and meets up with Aaron, his brother. And Aaron's kind of his like right-hand man, prophet kind of dude. And so before any of the plagues and all that start happening, he goes up, you know, up front to the Pharaoh. And they get into the chamber and everything. And God had told Aaron, hey, throw your staff down in front of the Pharaoh if he gives you any guff. And he'll be very impressed by what I'm about to do to that staff. And so they get in there pretty cocky, pretty confident. And Moses is like, hey, God told me you got to let all of the Jew slaves go. And the Pharaoh's like, why'd you even come back, Moses, first of all? And second, no, eat shit. Not a chance. No way. And so Moses gives Aaron like a sideways look and Aaron throws his staff down, immediately becomes a mighty serpent, a big snake on the ground, slithering around the throne room. And the Pharaoh's like, frankly, that's pretty cool. So he summons his wizards and his warlocks or priests or whatever. And he goes, hey, guys, can you guys do the thing where you throw your staff on the ground and it turns into snakes? And they go, oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's pretty fucking easy. So all like 10 of them throw their snakes, their staves on the ground, and all of them turn it into snakes too. And the pharaohs, and you know, so everybody's got a snake on the ground. Snake but makery. Aaron's, yeah, snake makery. And so Aaron's snake eats all of their snakes. And then the pharaohs Aha! like, that's all well and good, but this was not a who can make the bigger snake competition. <laughs> this was just a who can make snakes with magic competition. So I'm not convinced. Eat shit. I've got way more magic men than you and way more sticks to turn into snakes. <laughs> and so Moses and Aaron leave humiliated. You know, it's like they got pants. So they go out there and God tells them up front. He's like, hey, I know that I knew that trick wasn't going to work. You know, I just put, sent you in there to like, you know, build, set the stage. But I'm going to send a series of plagues upon the people of Egypt and I will harden the Pharaoh's heart so that he will not agree to anything after any of them until all of them are complete. And Moses and Aaron are like, why would you tell us that? Why would you let us know that no matter how good a salesman we are now, like you're, you're, you're going to keep them from saying yes until the very end? Like you, why, why would you pull the whatever? You know, because it, obviously they're not going to be as good a salesman if they know it's going to fail no matter what. So he tells them, all right. Go down to the Nile, slam your staff all dramatically on the water. Every bit of water in the Nile and in every pot, every pan, every uh, clay jar in all of Egypt is going to turn to blood. And so he goes down there, slams the staff. Immediately, everything is bloody, except for what the water that the Jews had. That's totally untouched. And so it starts to smell really bad after like two days. And so they go back to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's like, Honestly, this sucks. I am fucking thirsty. Like, and I've had nothing but blood for two days. <laughs> so, Let's get your iron. And so, and, so he, and so Moses is like, all right, well, are you willing to let us go? And Pharaoh goes, one sec, real quick. Hey, magic men, wizards, can you turn water into blood? And they go, oh, hell yeah. And so they turn some water into blood. Pharaoh immediately goes, fuck, that was a waste. Can you guys turn blood into water? <laughs> and then they go, no, we can't do that. And he goes, oh, damn it. <laughs> well, Moses, I promise I will let you go if you turn all this blood back to water. And Moses goes, oh, hell yeah. Swings his magic sword, his magic staff, rather, all of it back to water. Pharaoh immediately goes, ha, you fell for it. No, <laughs> absolutely not. Eat shit. So they go back, and God is like, don't worry. I knew that would happen, too. Moses is like, this is going to be this is gonna be a trend, Aaron. We better, <laughs> we better get used to this. Uh, God goes, all right, next Go strike the Nile again with your staff, and I will summon forth a horde of billions of frogs. And they're all going to just wreak havoc. And they're like, but what are frogs going to He's like, silence! <laughs> <laughs> you will do the frogs! And so they go back down to the Nile, slam the river. Immediately, billions of frogs start jumping out. And they weren't just coming out of the river. Like, people, like Egyptians were, like, sitting there getting their rice out of their fucking pot or whatever. And frogs start jumping out of there. And after... Another two, three days of frogs. You know, everybody did some gigging, had a fun time the first day, but you'd only do so much. <laughs> and then after that, they go back to Pharaoh and they go, are you getting tired of the frogs yet? He goes, honestly, I have an enormous palace and I've just paid people to stomp on them as they try to get in. It's, it hasn't been an issue. And uh, frankly, Ted, head wizard, he showed me how to make frogs. Stop making them now, Ted. There's enough. There's enough. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, I can do that too. Not that impressed. 
But once again, my wizards don't know how to get rid of frogs. Do you know how to get rid of frogs? And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah. And he goes, all right, get rid of the frogs, and I promise I'll let you go. Moses waves his staff, all the frogs. Okay, this is an interesting thing. Kind of like in Skyrim, where you run out of magicka, and you have to wait to recharge. God used too much of his magicka to create all the frogs, and so he wasn't able to just suck them back into oblivion. He just killed all of them. Just all these frogs died. And so the next couple verses in the Bible are like, and they swept the frogs into piles, <laughs> and did they reek? And, like, that kind of and so there's just big piles of, of, of rotting amphibians. And so then immediately the pharaoh goes, eat shit. No, no, no. My heart feels hard all of a sudden. No. And so they go back. I'm going to lump plagues three and four together because there's fucking ten of these. And <laughs> And Plagues 3 and 4 were not original. One was gnats and one was flies. And they both basically happen the same way where God tells them, do this, you know, hit the ground and every mote of dust will turn into a flea that will be leaping. It'll look like Woody's carpet, you know, across the whole land, the whole land of Egypt. And that's what he did. And then eventually goes back into the throne room, goes, hey, you impressed? And he goes, no. All of my magic men have been making fleas all morning to show they can, but we don't know how to get rid of them. And so, swings his staff, all of them go, Pharaoh says, eat shit. No, you can't leave again. And so then, they go back to God, and God goes, all right, we're about to turn this stove up to medium. And they go, can we just, can we just go to high? Can we just go to high? Because at this time, they don't know the future, but they do know that God is obsessed with round numbers and the number seven. And so like in Aaron and, and Moses' talk, they're like, this is either going to seven, best case scenario, worst case scenario, ten. You know, so just keep, keep forging through. So the fifth one is, he goes, all right, Moses, slam your staff on the ground, and every single animal that Egyptians own is going to die. All of them. They're all going to die except for the ones that the Jews own. And so he does that. All of their animals die, goes back in there, and goes, hey, uh, have you noticed anything about your entire economy, Pharaoh? And he goes, yeah, it's, it's destroyed. It's crashed. Thousands will starve. Millions will starve. We have no more animals. And they go, yeah, that sucks. And then he goes, all right, we'll bring all our animals back to life, and then I'll let you go. And then they're like, actually, that's one that we don't know how to do that. Even God can't bring that back. And he goes, all right, well, then fuck you. Get out of here. Sends him back again. Then God goes, all right, they've been very uncomfortable in their lifestyle, but physically they haven't felt the burn. So, Aaron, I want you to walk down to the Nile, grab some fine sand on the, on the beach of it, toss it in the air, and everyone in Egypt will be stricken with boils. And so throws it in the air. Everyone in Egypt has boils, terribly, and after a couple days of the boils, shows back up at the Pharaoh's palace. Goes, hey, all of us Jews are looking fantastic out there. Nice olive skin, looking good, you know, noses for shade. Everything's going well. And he goes, well, for me, it's been terrible. You know, uh, Moses actually asked, he's like, hey, where's, where's all the magic men? Where are all your magic men? And they go, well, actually, they got hit extra hard with the boils, so they called in sick. And so they, their magic men are out. Like they, can't, they can't compete anymore with this. Pharaoh promises him. He's standing in front of his throne because he has so many ass boils. It's, it's impossible to sit. Oh. And he says, I promise you guys. I promise you. I'm in my head. I know I'm going to say you can go as soon as you get rid of these boils. I promise. And then the boils are removed by Moses. And then immediately Pharaoh's like, ah, oh, like, I want to say you can go. But the only thing that... My heart is so hard. Like, I, I don't know what's going on. I'm, I'm trying to, here, listen to this. I'm trying to say, yes, you can go. No, you can't leave. But I, did you hear that? I'm trying so hard to say, I guess you guys can't go. I, I, I literally can't. And of course, Moses and Aaron are like, yeah, because you're getting fucked with by our God, who's kind of a cunt. And God already told them at this point, hey, the only reason I'm keeping this charade going is because I need people in the future to be able to look back and go, man, the Jewish God does not fuck around. Like, and clearly he doesn't. Like, Moses should have went up there and been like, hey, uh, this, our God, who's on our team, made us cut the tips of our fucking dicks off before we could join his club. What do you think he's gonna do to you? <laughs> he's gonna butt fuck you. He doesn't <laughs> shit about you and your people. And, but as soon as the boils are gone, God hardens Pharaoh's heart again and, say, and Pharaoh is forced to say, no, I can't. I can't, I can't let you go. And so then he goes, God goes, all right, you need to go back to the Pharaoh again 
and tell him to tell every Egyptian that there is a hailstorm coming, the likes of which this country's never seen. And anyone who is outside who's Egyptian, when this storm hits tomorrow, is will die. All of the remaining animals you have, if you have any, will be struck by lightning or hit with hail. And most of the Egyptians were like, dude, this guy's six for six so far, so I'm staying in tomorrow. But a couple cocky ones were like, oh, what does he know? Osiris will protect us. And so they're like out there like trying to get their animals back up. Hailstorm comes. Everyone who's outside dies. Like, like these are, you know, Moses was telling them up front, these are going to be like cantaloupe-sized, you know, hail. And they're like, what's that? And he's like, oh, fuck. Like a, <laughs> a melon, a fruit. And, and so after two days of that, goes back in. Pharaoh's like, this is ridiculous. Like my entire country's collapsing. Like, uh, everyone. I I've lost hundreds of thousands of people. People are starving to death. Please, please, leave. Just stop this storm. Stops the storm, and like a switch, once again, God, like, hardens his heart, and Pharaoh goes, no, you can't leave. Can't leave. Nope. And they're like, are you sure, Pharaoh? And he's like, like, in the eyes of someone in a movie who, like, has their mind controlled, where he's like, please get out of here. <laughs> get out of here. No, you can't leave. No. Like, doing that kind of shit. Very fucked up. Very, very fucked up. And so then goes back again to God, goes, all right, what, what do you have for him now? What can we possibly do? And God goes, locusts, locusts. I'm going to send locusts on him. And Aaron and Moses are kind of like, that's your third bug related. <laughs> that's what bug. I was thinking. <laughs> and uh, I'm confused in this because it seems like four times we've already destroyed all of their food, right? <laughs> Like, we kill them all with this, we kill them all with that. What are, what are we doing other than creating craters for us to walk through on our way out of here? Like, <laughs> what, what, what's going on? He goes, I, I, obviously, that part didn't happen in the Bible. You don't talk back to the Jewish God. And so, locusts come. Frankly, a lot of the Egyptians were probably happy to see them because they could eat something. You know, yeah. suddenly these frogs were like, bring the frogs back! Like, <laughs> that again. But they ruin all the rest of the crops. Hundreds of thousands of people are starving. Goes up to the pharaoh, says, can, I, can we go now? Pharaoh wants to say yes so bad, gets rid of it. Pharaoh can't say yes. God forbids him from saying yes. He hardens his heart. So then he goes back again. The ninth one, which was basically the way this like climax worked, is that God was like building, like stroking himself, getting near climax. And when he got to the hail, that was like edging, yeah. you know, where he was about to come, but he, he couldn't finish there. He has to get to the round number. And so then he had to like ease himself off a bit with the locusts. And then the ninth plague, which was darkness, where he just makes everything dark for three days straight. Day and night, total darkness. The only light is a beacon from heaven on the Israelites' uh, area where they are because they're still untouched. They're, they're hunky-dory, good to go. A lot of resentment from the neighboring Egyptians, though. Uh, and so after three days of that, you know, Moses has to stumble back into the palace. He goes, hey, we can't even, uh, Pharaoh rather goes, hey, we can't even grow the crops back because there's no light. Please turn the lights back on, Moses. Turn the lights back on. Moses turns the lights back on, only to see Pharaoh sitting there, this right in his face, going, <laughs> hell for it again, idiot. And then sends him back out there. And he, and he says, uh, or no, that's a bit later. So he goes back out there, and then God, God's ready to climax by now. He's ready to come his wrath all over the people of Egypt. And so he goes back and God says, hey, we're about to amp this up. It's number 10. All the firstborn children of every Egyptian will die. All the firstborn animals of every Egyptian animal will die. Aaron and, Aaron and Moses are like, There's, there haven't been any fucking animals in five plagues. <laughs> like, it's, it's, they're gone. And so, and so comes back. There's like way too many verses of... God going to, to Moses and saying, all right, need to make sure the Israelites get this kind of goat, get this kind of sheep, do this, don't eat the bones, make sure you put the right amount of blood on the threshold of your door. And so the point of that is that God was going to send the angel of death to come into Egypt. And any house that didn't have blood of a one-year-old male pure lamb or goat on the top and sides of the doorframe, anyone who had that would be passed over. That's why it's called Passover for the Jews. You know, they're celebrating not being murdered by their vengeful God. And so Angel of Death goes through, murders every single firstborn child in all of Egypt. The way they describe it in the Bible is that there was not a home in Egypt where someone had not died. Every house in Egypt, because it didn't matter like, uh, like if you're 50 years old, but you were the oldest of your kids, you're dead. 
Yeah. You're dead too. Like if, if both your parents were first born, sorry, little Egyptian boy, you're dead. Like your parents are dead and your older siblings dead. And so it describes the wailing for a while in the Bible. And it says it was a wailing unlike anything that had been heard on this earth before. A wailing, a gnashing of teeth and for the, the sadness that these people felt. And, yet, and it wasn't the elite of Egypt. Every Egyptian from Pharaoh to slave because they had more than just the Jewish slaves. And so some poor, poor fucker from Babylon, who was also a slave, it's like, oh no, not the my kids. Or like, wherever the <laughs> fuck he's from, he went up to Norway, grabbed someone, brought him down. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Go back, and they're like about to enter the palace again, and Pharaoh like comes out on his, his, pa- his stoop or whatever, and is like, get the fuck out! Get out of here now. And they're like, are you serious? Are you for real this time? Nope takes his back seats. And he's like, yeah, for real. Get the fuck out of here. But what Pharaoh had forgotten is that he was not only dealing with God, but also with Jews. (laughs) And so the Jews said, well, before we get out of here, we're going to need some gold and some silver. (laughs) (laughs) Spices to, you know, make sure we're comfortable. And he's like, whatever, dude, whatever. Everyone, give give them whatever you have. Give them all the silver and gold you have. Get these fucking cursed people out of here. Out of here. So they all load up in all their shit, and they head off into the desert. And that's where this chapter of the story ends. Prior to the whole Red Sea thing. Yeah. So that is a very abridged version of the Bible. I... And it's mostly <clears throat> true. It, it's absolutely <laughs> not true at all because there Amazing. were no Jewish slaves in Egypt. No, I'm saying according to the book, it's pretty oh. true. I, oh. I mean, the story I told was oh, pretty I ac- see. A- I, accurate to the Bible. I see one of my saying. favorite things about Taylor Bible Time is that later on, a couple weeks from now, maybe even a couple months... I will get a call from my parents who fact check it <laughs> and tell me like, yeah, you know what? It wasn't that God was edging uh, and about to come during the <laughs> sixth plague. <laughs> and, and we'll, we'll, like, I remember you described like, I mean, like, I don't know why they mixed up his, you know, goat hair with it. My mom was like, he was a very hairy guy. I think Taylor <laughs> didn't, didn't exaggerate that quite enough or whatever. But, uh. Yes, yeah, so I can't I mean, wait to hear my mom try to take that apart and tell me where you went wrong. I, I've, that, that, I've seen the accurate. movie. Have you seen the movie? <laughs> the, yes, I have. The, the Disney movie? Exodus, or Gods, and Kings. Movie? Exodus, Gods, and Kings. Ah. So they, they attack the situation of Moses in, in two ways where it's the religious people. They go, oh, it's God has done this. And then you have the scientists which go, well... Technically, if you take all the frogs away, obviously there's going to be a lot of flies still alive. Stuff like that. Yeah. It's a, it's a pretty interesting. At first, I thought you guys were like pulling a prank on me with this whole Bible talk. Oh, this is no, a, like, a ten pole topic Bible around here. I've yeah. like <laughs> never, in my few times that I've been on PKA, we, I've never experienced Bible talk. Oh, it's highly requested. Uh, <laughs> it's one Shut of the most up. highly requested topics not to jack myself off. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of it because because like after you hear a ridiculous story like that you have to stop and remember <laughs> that there are billions of people who believe this and That's are willing fact, to factual. kill are willing to kill and die over 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 these facts mm-hmm. and the again most, like uh, if you care about like reality uh just just know there were no uh egyptians in bondage in in egypt ever and if there were they certainly didn't build any of the pyramids or the structures. Well, they, they were never that. slaves, right? That's that's what the the yeah. scientists and uh, yeah, geologists it, was, it was professional artisans. Were never yeah. slaves. These were Egypt. highly paid craftsmen who actually constructed the uh, the things you you see in Egypt, all of the 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 the, the, the pyramids and such. I mean, you could tell that by not just the quality of the craftsmanship that this was a well trained housing, person, and, but also and, the housing they lived in, the food that they had available, the implements, uh, you know, everything down to the the quality of the pottery that they had in their domiciles. You know, these were well paid artisans of their time who created yeah. those uh, the, those you know, if, uh, giant. If Woody's mom is going to go through and and fact check me, more important than the facts of the plagues, and he actually didn't slam his staff down there. Blah blah blah. The actual thing to talk about in that story to do with the religion of of Christianity or Judaism is that the Lord repeatedly and continually forced the Pharaoh to harden his heart. You can't give someone free will 
and then force the what it was is like you know when you're dominating a game of Civ or Age of Empires and Queen Elizabeth is like oh please let me retire with some dignity and it comes up as yes or no and you go no <laughs> and you just burn them down like that's the fucked up part about it really is as far as like Christian canon is that yeah. God directly intervened, changed the ability to make a decision, thereby infringing on his own gift of free will, in order for his own macabre story to play out. Yeah, it's so like if there's when anything we used to, she takes qualms with, then when we used that's to play, what I'm interested to hear. When we used to play Call of Duty 4 and we'd be destroying someone in domination and the game's about to end, so we let them capture two flags, so the game will just keep going on for a while and we can yeah. force it. Yeah. That's exactly that's, what God was doing. That's yeah. exactly, yeah. God, <laughs> God is a hateful... A uh, fourteen-year-old cod player, apparently, who just likes playing with his food. Mm -hmm. Yep, he's a Old Testament God's a real piece of shit. Rough customer, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you told yeah. the one before, didn't like the? Is it Lot? Lock? He let his daughters get raped? Maybe? Yes. Ah, yeah. well, he was, he was about he was to willing let them get to. Raped. Yeah, uh, but but then he went ahead and fucked him himself. So, I uh, mean, you, know, you know, decide which which of those situations is more uh, oh, more out there. Well, he was drunk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jeez, Quinn. Why are you so <laughs> judgmental? Drunk. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you get, you get a little wine in you. Uh, you know, Woody. Yeah. <laughs> get a little wine in you. And then a lot later that night was like, oh, the floor of this cave is so cold. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm in a bun. You know, talking about Woody when he was like. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank God this cave is so cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lot, Lot was a, uh, a a pretty devout guy. It's interesting that he was so devout within a city of those who were so the opposite. It's almost as if the story was completely made up and meant to be a parable. It, that's no, I'm pretty sure it's true. Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I like you whenever his when, I like whenever some like historian air quotes is like we believe we found the city of Sodom and the city of Gomorrah. It's like. Did, unless it literally says Sodom on like a big placard that you found outside this motherfucker, like 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 ye old Sodom, like Sodom House of Sodomy and more, like like no, you just found an old fucking city that got that that's been abandoned and destroyed or something like that. Like I I, I hate yeah. that so much. Remember when people were always finding the Ark, or not the Ark, but um the uh the, the no, Noah's the Ark. Ark. Yeah, Noah's the Ark. Ark. You're right. They found the Ark. Like four times in my teens. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, oh, but, but, but which what? Like, it's a that one has metal in it. Like, fun story. One of my uh, one of my good friends, still good friends. His mom was like super religious, right? So uh, she would go to church, and then the pastor is like, "You, you're not allowed to wear jeans. You can only wear like dresses and stuff like that." And she's like, "Okay," and then does it right, throws out all her jeans, and then he comes over and he goes, "Hmm, your son." Yeah, that computer of his, it's uh, the demon is in the devil's inside of him. Demons are inside of him. And she like believed it and was like, So what do I do with this computer? And he's like, Give it to me. I'll make sure that, <laughs> make sure that the demons they go away from your son. Yeah. And uh, she she would come up to me and be like, Jordy, like you you know there are demons in here, you don't go to church. I'm like, listen, like I was a like 14, 15. I'm like, I don't believe in any of that stuff. You know, I respect you believing in it, and you know, I'm down to have a conversation. But please show me any any proof, any proof that any of these stories that you just told me is actually real, and I will research it. And and then obviously, I'm I'm super open to actually believe in something. And she goes and links me this shady article on like Yahoo News of like Noah's Ark has been discovered in 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 Syria or something like that. And I'm like, what? It's just like, it's 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 not yeah. it's, it's fake. It's it's like, prove you know it. how like, how I, how boats made of wood stay together for five and a half thousand yeah, years? Yeah, no, that just doesn't work that way. <laughs>